among most of the mathematicians I have known in Europe, although I could never discover the least analogy between the two sciences, unless those people suppose that because the smallest circle has as many degrees as the largest, therefore the regulation and management of the world require no more abilities than the handling and turning of a globe. But I rather take this quality to spring from a very common infirmity of human nature, inclining us to be most curious and conceited in manners where we have least concern, and from which we are least adapted by study or nature. These people are under continual disquietudes, never enjoying a minute's peace of mind, and their disturbances proceed from causes which very little affect the rest of mortals. Their apprehensions arise from several changes they dread in the celestial bodies. For instance, that the earth, by the continual approaches of the sun towards it, must, in course of time, be absorbed or swallowed up. That the face of the sun will, by degrees, be encrusted with its own effluvia, and give no more light to the world. That the earth very narrowly escaped a brush from the tail of the last comet, which would have infallibly reduced it to ashes, and that the next, which they have calculated for one and thirty years hence, will probably destroy us. For if, in its prehelion, it should approach within a certain degree of the sun, as by their calculations they have reason to dread, it will receive a degree of heat ten thousand times more intense than that of a red, hot, glowing iron and, in its absence from the sun, carry a blazing tail ten hundred thousand and fourteen miles long, through which, if the earth should pass at a distance of one hundred miles from the nucleus, or the main body of the comet, it must, in its passage, be set on fire, and reduced to ashes, that the sun, daily spending its rays without any nutriment to supply them, will at last be wholly consumed and annihilated, which must be attended with the destruction of this earth, and of all the planets that receive their light from it. They are so perpetually alarmed with the apprehensions of these, and the like impending dangers, that they can neither sleep quietly in their beds, nor have any relish for the common pleasures and amusements of life. When they meet an acquaintance in the morning, the first question is about the sun's health, how he looked at his setting and rising, and what hopes they have to avoid the stroke of the approaching comet. This conversation they are apt to run into with the same temper that boys discover in delighting to hear terrible stories of spirits and hobgoblins, which they greedily listen to, and dare not go to bed for fear. The women of the island have abundance of vivacity, they contemn their husbands, and are exceedingly fond of strangers, whereof there is always a considerable number from the continent below, attending at court, either upon affairs of the several towns and corporations, or their own particular occasions, but are much despised, because they want the same endowments. Among these the ladies choose their gallants, but the vexation is, that they act with too much ease and security, for the husband is always so wrapped in speculation, that the mistress and lover may proceed to the greatest familiarities before his face, if he be but provided with paper and implements, and without his flapper at his side. The wives and daughters lament their confinement to the island, although I think it is the most delicious spot of ground in the world, and although they live here in the greatest plenty and magnificence, and are allowed to do whatever they please, they long to see the world, and take the diversions of the metropolis, which they are not allowed to do without a particular license from the king, and that is not easy to be obtained, because the people of quality have found, by frequent experience, how hard it is to persuade their women to return from below. I was told that a great court lady, who had several children, is married to the Prime Minister, the richest subject in the kingdom, a very graceful person, extremely fond of her, and lives in the finest palace of the island. 
went down to Lagado on the pretense of health, there hid herself for several months, till the king sent a warrant to search for her, and she was found in an obscure eating-house all in rags, having pawned her clothes to maintain an old, deformed footman, who beat her every day, and in whose company she was taken much against her will. And although her husband received her with all possible kindness, and without the least reproach, she soon after contrived to steal down again, with all her jewels, to the same gallant, and has not been heard of since. This may perhaps pass with the reader, rather for a European or English story, than for one of a country so remote. But he may please to consider that the caprices of womankind are not limited by any climate or nation, and that they are much more uniform than can be easily imagined. In about a month's time, I had made a tolerable proficiency in their language, and was able to answer most of the king's questions, when I had the honour to attend him. His majesty discovered not the least curiosity to inquire into the laws, government, history, religion, or manners of the countries where I had been, but confined his questions to the state of mathematics, and received the account I gave him with great contempt and indifference, though often roused by his flapper on each side. End of part three, chapter two. Part three, chapter three of Gulliver's Travels. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part three. A voyage to Laputa, Balnibarbi, Lugnag, Glubdub Drib, and Japan. Chapter three. A phenomenon solved by modern philosophy and astronomy. The Laputian's great improvements in the latter. The king's method of suppressing insurrections. I desired leave of this prince to see the curiosities of the island, which he was graciously pleased to grant, and ordered my tutor to attend me. I chiefly wanted to know to what cause, in art or in nature, it owed its several motions, whereof I will now give a philosophical account to the reader. The flying or floating island is exactly circular, its diameter 7,837 yards, or about four miles and a half, and consequently contains ten thousand acres. It is three hundred yards thick. The bottom, or under surface, which appears to those who view it below, is one even regular plate of adamant, shooting up to the height of about two hundred yards. Above it lie the several minerals in their usual order, and over all is a coat of rich mould, ten or twelve feet deep, the declivity of the upper surface, from the circumference to the centre, is the natural cause why all the dews and rains, which fall upon the island, are conveyed in small rivulets towards the middle, where they are emptied into four large basins, each of about half a mile in circuit, and two hundred yards distant from the centre. From these basins the water is continually exhaled by the sun in the daytime, which effectually prevents their overflowing. Besides, as it is in the power of the monarch to raise the island above the rain of clouds and vapours, he can prevent the falling of dews and rain whenever he pleases. For the highest clouds cannot rise above two miles, as naturalists agree. At least, they were never known to do so in that country. At the centre of the island, there is a chasm about fifty yards in diameter, whence the astronomers descend into a large dome which is thereof called Flandona Gagnol, or the Astronomer's Cave, situated at the depth of a hundred yards beneath the upper surface of the adamant. In this cave are twenty lamps continually burning, which, from the reflection of the adamant, cast a strong light into every part. The place is stored with great variety of sextants, quadrants, telescopes, astrolabes, and other astronomical instruments. 
but the greatest curiosity, upon which the fate of the island depends, is a lodestone of a prodigious size, in shape resembling a weaver's shuttle. It is in length six yards, and in the thickest part at least three yards over. This magnet is sustained by a very strong axle of adamant, passing through its middle, upon which it plays, and is poised so exactly that the weakest hand can turn it. It is hooped round with a hollow cylinder of adamant, four feet yards in diameter, placed horizontally, and supported by eight adamantine feet, each six yards high. In the middle of the concave side, there is a groove twelve inches deep, in which the extremities of the axle are lodged, and turned round as there is occasion. The stone cannot be removed from its place by any force, because the hoop and its feet are one continued piece with that body of adamant, which constitutes the bottom of the island. By means of this lodestone, the island is made to rise and fall, and move from one place to another. For with respect to that part of the earth over which the monarch presides, the stone is endured at one side of its side with an attractive power, and at the other with a repulsive. Upon placing the magnet erect, with its attracting end towards the earth, the island descends. But when the repelling extremity points downwards, the island mounts directly upwards. When the position of the stone is oblique, the motion of the island is too for in this magnet the forces always act in lines parallel to its direction. By this oblique motion the island is conveyed to different parts of the monarch's dominions. To explain the manner of its progress, let AB represent a line drawn across the dominions of Balnababi. Let the line CD represent the lodestone, of which D be the repelling end, and C the attracting end. The island being over capital C, let the stone be placed in position CD, with its repelling end downwards. Then the island will be driven upwards obliquely towards capital D. When it is arrived at capital D, let the stone be turned upon its axle, till the attracting end points towards E, and then the island will be carried obliquely towards E, where, if the stone being again turned upon its axle, till it stands in the position EF, with its repelling point downwards, the island will rise obliquely towards F, where, by directing the attracting end towards G, the island may be carried to G, and from G to H, by turning the stone, so as to make its repelling extremity to point directly downwards. And thus, by changing the situation of the stone, as often as there is occasion, the island is made to rise and fall, by turns, in an oblique direction, and by those alternate risings and fallings, the obliquity being not considerable, is conveyed from one part of the dominions to the other. But it must be observed, that this island cannot move beyond the extent of the dominions below, nor can it rise above the height of four miles, for which the astronomers, who have written large systems concerning the stone, assign the following reason. That the magnetic virtue does not extend beyond the distance of four miles, and that the mineral, which acts upon the stone in the bowels of the earth, and in the sea about six leagues distance from the shore, is not diffused through the whole globe, but terminated with the limits of the king's dominions. And it was easy, from the great advantage of such a superior situation, for a prince to bring under his obedience whatever country lay within the attraction of that magnet. When the stone is put parallel to the plane of the horizon, the island stands still, for in that case the extremities of it, being at equal distance from the earth, act with equal force, the one in drawing downwards, the other in pushing upwards and consequently no motion can ensue. This lodestone is under the care of certain astronomers, who, from time to time, give it such positions as the monarch directs. They spend the greatest part of their lives in observing the celestial bodies, 
which they do by the assistance of glasses, far excelling ours in goodness. For, although their largest telescopes do not exceed three feet, they magnify much more than those of a hundred with us, and show the stars with greater clearness. This advantage has enabled them to extend their discoveries much further than our astronomers in Europe, for they have made a catalogue of ten thousand fixed stars, whereas the largest of ours do not contain above one third part of that number. They have likewise discovered two lesser stars, or satellites, which revolve about Mars, whereof the innermost is distant from the centre of the primary planet exactly three of his diameters, and the outermost five. The former revolves in the space of ten hours, and the latter in twenty-one and a half, so that the squares of the periodical times are very near in the same proportion with the cubes of their distance from the centre of Mars, which evidently shows them to be governed by the same law of gravitation that influences the other heavenly bodies. They have observed ninety-three different comets, and settled their periods with great exactness. If this be true, and they affirm it with great confidence, it is much to be wished that their observations were made public, whereby the theory of comets, which at present is very lame and defective, might be brought to the same perfection with other arts of astronomy. The king would be the most absolute prince in the universe, if he could but prevail on a ministry to join with him. But these, having their estates below on the continent, and considering that the office of a favourite has a very uncertain tenure, would never consent to the enslaving of their country. If any town should engage in rebellion or mutiny, fall into violent factions, or refuse to pay the usual tribute, the king has two methods of reducing them to obedience. The first and mildest course is, by keeping the island hovering over such a town and the lands about it, whereby he can deprive them of the benefit of the sun and the rain, and consequently afflict the inhabitants with dearth and disease. And if the crime deserve it, they are at the same time pelted from above with great stones, against which they have no defence, but by creeping into cellars or caves, while the roofs of their houses are beaten to pieces. But, if they still continue obstinate, or offer to raise insurrections, he proceeds to the last remedy, by letting the island drop directly upon their heads, which makes a universal destruction both of houses and men. However, this is an extremity to which the prince is seldom driven, neither, indeed, is he willing to put it in execution, nor dare his ministers advise him to an action, which, as it would render them odious to the people, so it would be a great damage to their own estates, which all lie below, for the island is the king's domain. But there is still indeed a more weighty reason, kings of this country have always been averse from executing so terrible an action, unless upon the utmost necessity. For if the town intended to be destroyed, should have in it any tall rocks, as it generally falls out in the larger cities, a situation probably chosen at first, with a view to prevent such a catastrophe. Or, if it abound in high spires, or pillars of stone, a sudden fall might endanger the bottom or under-surface of the island, which, although it consist, as I have said, of one entire adamant, two hundred yards thick, might happen to crack by too great a shock or burst by approaching too near the fires from the houses below. As the backs, both of iron and stone, will often do in our chimneys. Of all this the people are well appraised, and understand how far to carry their obstinacy, where their liberty or property is concerned. And the king, when he is highest provoked, and most determined to press the city to rubbish, orders the island to descend with great gentleness, out of a pretense of tenderness to his people, but, indeed, for fear of breaking the adamantine bottom. In which case, 
it is the opinion of all the philosophers that the lodestone could no longer hold it up, and the whole mass would fall to the ground. By a fundamental law of this realm, neither the king nor either of his two eldest sons are permitted to leave the island, nor the queen, till she is past childbearing. End of part three, chapter three. Part three, chapter four of Gulliver's Travels. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part three. A voyage to Laputa, Balnabarbi, Lugnag, Glubdub Drib, and Japan. Chapter four. The author leaves Laputa, is conveyed to Balnabarbi, arrives at the metropolis. A description of the metropolis and the country adjoining. The author hospitably received by a great lord. His conversation with that lord. Although I cannot say that I was ill-treated in this island, yet I must confess I thought myself too much neglected, not without some degree of contempt, for neither prince nor people appeared to be curious in any part of knowledge, except mathematics and music, wherein I was far their inferior, and upon that account very little regarded. On the other side, after having seen all the curiosities of the island, I was very desirous to leave it, being heartily weary of those people. They were indeed excellent in two sciences for which I have great esteem, and wherein I am not unversed. But, at the same time, so abstracted and involved in speculation, that I have never met with such disagreeable companions. I conversed only with women, tradesmen, flappers, and court pages, during two months of my abode there by which, at least, I rendered myself extremely contemptible. Yet these were the only people from whom I could ever receive a reasonable answer. I had obtained, by hard study, a good degree of knowledge in their language. I was weary of being confined to an island where I received so little countenance, and resolved to leave it with the first opportunity. There was a great lord at court, nearly related to the king, and for that reason alone used with respect. He was universally reckoned the most ignorant and stupid person among them. He had performed many eminent services for the crown, had great natural and acquired parts, adorned with integrity and honour, but so ill an ear for music that his detractors reported he had been often known to beat time in the wrong place. Neither could his tutors, without extreme difficulty, teach him to demonstrate the most easy proposition in the mathematics. He was pleased to show me many marks of favour, often did me the honour of a visit, desired to be informed in the affairs of Europe, the laws and customs, the manners and learning of the several countries where I had travelled. He listened to me with great attention, and made very wise observations on all I spoke. He had two flappers attending him for state, but never made use of them, except at court and in visits of ceremony, and would always command them to withdraw when we were alone together. I entreated this illustrious person to intercede in my behalf with his majesty, for leave to depart, which he accordingly did, as he was pleased to tell me, with great regret, for indeed he had made me several offers very advantageous which, however, I refused, with expressions of the highest acknowledgment. On the 16th of February I took leave of His Majesty and the court. The king made me a present to the value of about two hundred pounds English, and my protector, his kinsman, as much more, together with a letter of recommendation to a friend of his in Lagado, the metropolis. The island being then hovering over a mountain about two miles from it, I was let down from the lowest gallery, in the same manner I had been taken up. The continent, as far as it is subject to the monarch of the flying island, passes under the general name of Balnabarbi, and the metropolis, 
as I have said before, is called Lagado. I felt some little satisfaction in finding myself on firm ground. I walked to the city without any concern, being clad like one of the natives, and sufficiently instructed to converse with them. I soon found out the person's house to whom I was recommended, presented my letter from his friend, the grandee in the island, and was received with much kindness. This great lord, whose name was Minodi, ordered me an apartment in his own house, where I continued during my stay, and was entertained in a most hospitable manner. The next morning after my arrival, he took me in his chariot to see the town, which is about half the bigness of London, but the house is very strangely built, and most of them out of repair. The people in the streets walked fast, looked wild, their eyes fixed, and were generally in rags. We passed through one of the town gates, and went about three miles into the country, where I saw many labourers working with several sorts of tools in the ground, but was not able to conjecture what they were about. Neither did observe any expectation either of corn or grass, although the soil appeared to be excellent. I could not forbear admiring at these odd appearances, both in town and country, and I made bold to desire my conductor that he would be pleased to explain to me what could be meant by so many busy heads, hands, and faces, both in the streets and the fields, because I did not discover any good effects they produced. But, on the contrary, I never knew a soil so unhappily cultivated, houses so ill-contrived and so ruinous, or a people whose countenances and habit expressed so much misery and want. This Lord Monodi was a person of the first rank, and had been some years governor of Lagado, but, by a cable of ministers, was discharged for insufficiency. However, the king treated him with tenderness, as a well-meaning man, but of a low, contemptible understanding. When I gave that free censure of the country and its inhabitants, he made no further answer than by telling me that I had not been long enough among them to form a judgment, and that the different nations of the world had different customs, with other common topics to the same purpose. But, when we returned to his palace, he asked me how I liked the building, what absurdities I observed, and what quarrel I had with the dress or look of his domestics. This he might safely do, because everything about him was magnificent, regular, and polite. I answered that His Excellency's prudence, quality, and fortune had exempted him from those defects which folly and beggary had produced in others. He said, if I would go with him to his country house, about twenty miles distant, where his estate lay, there would be more leisure for this kind of conversation. I told his excellency that I was entirely at his disposal, and accordingly we set out next morning. During our journey he made me observe the several methods used by farmers in managing their lands, which, to me, were wholly unaccountable, for, except in some very few places, I could not discover one ear of corn or blade of grass. But in three hours travelling the scene was wholly altered. We came into a most beautiful country, farmers' houses at small distances neatly built, the fields enclosed, containing vineyards, corn grounds and meadows. Neither do I remember to have seen a more delightful prospect. His Excellency observed my countenance to cheer up. He told me, with a sigh, that there his estate began, and would continue the same, till we should come to his house, that his countrymen ridiculed and despised him for managing his affairs no better, and for setting so ill an example to the kingdom, which, however, was followed by very few, such as were old and willful and weak like himself. We came at length to the house, which was indeed a noble structure, built according to the best rules of ancient architecture. The fountains, gardens, walks, avenues, and groves were all disposed with exact judgment and taste. I gave due praises to everything I saw. 
whereof his excellency took not the least notice till after supper, when, there being no third companion, he told me with a very melancholy air, that he doubted he must throw down his houses in town and country, to rebuild them after the present mode, destroy all his plantations, and cast others into such a form as modern usage required, and give the same directions to all his tenants, unless he would submit to incur the censure of pride, singularity, affectation, ignorance, caprice, and perhaps increase his majesty's displeasure, that the admiration I appeared to be under would cease or diminish, when he had informed me of some particulars which, probably, I had never heard of at court, the people there being too much taken up in their own speculations, to have regard to what passed here below. The sum of his discourse was to this effect, that about forty years ago certain persons went up to Laputa, either upon business or diversion, and, after five months' continuance, came back with a very little smattering in mathematics, but full of volatile spirits acquired in that airy region. That these persons, upon their return, began to dislike the management of everything below, and fell into schemes of putting all arts, sciences, languages, and mechanics upon a new foot. To this end they procured a royal patent for erecting an academy of projectors in Lagado, and the humour prevailed so strongly among the people, that there is not a town of any consequence in the kingdom without such an academy. In these colleges the professors contrive new rules and methods of agriculture and building, and new instruments and new tools for all trades and manufacturers, whereby, as they undertake, one man shall do the work of ten, a palace may be built in a week, of materials so durable as to last for ever without repairing. All the fruits of the earth shall come to maturity at whatever season we think fit to choose, and increase a hundredfold more than they do at present, with innumerable other happy proposals. The only inconvenience is, that none of these projects are yet brought to perfection, and in the meantime the whole country lies miserably waste, the houses in ruin, and the people without food or clothes, by all which, instead of being discouraged, they are fifty times more violently bent upon prosecuting their schemes, driven equally on by hope and despair. But as for himself, being not of an enterprising spirit, he was content to go on in the old forms, to live in a house as his ancestors had built, and act as they did, in every part of life, without innovation. That some few other persons of quality and gentry had done the same, but were looked on with an eye of contempt and ill-will, as enemies to art, ignorant and ill-commonwealth's men, preferring their own ease and sloth before the general improvement of their country. His lordship added, that he would not, by any further particulars, prevent the pleasure I should certainly take in viewing the Grand Academy, whether he was resolved I should go. He only desired me to observe a ruined building, upon the side of a mountain about three miles distant, of which he gave me this account. There had been a very convenient mill within half a mile of his house, turned by a current from a large river, and sufficient for his own family, as well as a great number of his tenants. That about seven years ago, a club of those projectors came to him with proposals to destroy this mill and build another on the side of that mountain, on the long ridge whereof a long canal must be cut, for a repository of water, to be conveyed up by pipes and engines to supply the mill, because the wind and air upon a height agitated the water, and thereby made it fitter for motion, and because the water, descending down into declivity, would turn the mill with half the current of a river, whose course is more upon a level. He said, that being then not very well with the court, and pressed by many of his friends, he complied with the proposal, and after employing a hundred men for two years, the work miscarried, the projectors went off, laying the blame entirely upon him, railing at him ever since, and putting others upon the same experiment, with equal assurance of success, as well as equal disappointment. In a few days we came back to town, 
and his excellency considering the bad character he had in the academy would not go with me himself but recommended me to a friend of his to bear me company thither my lord was pleased to represent me as a great admirer of projects and a person of much curiosity and easy belief which indeed was not without truth for i had myself been a sort of projector in my younger days End of part three, chapter four. Part three, chapter five of Gulliver's Travels. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part three. A voyage to Laputa, Balnibarbi, Lugnag, Club Dub Drib, and Japan. Chapter five. The author is permitted to see the Grand Academy of Legado, the Academy largely described, the arts wherein the professors employ themselves. This Academy is not an entire single building, but a continuation of several houses on both sides of a street, which, growing waste, was purchased and applied to that use. I was received very kindly by the warden, and went for many days to the academy. Every room has in it one or more projectors, and I believe it could not be in fewer than five hundred rooms. The first man I saw was of a meagre aspect, with sooty hands and face, his hair and beard long, ragged, and singed in several places. His clothes, shirt, and skin were all of the same colour. He had been eight years upon a project for extracting sunbeams out of cucumbers, which were to be put in vials, hermetically sealed, and let out to warm the air in raw, inclement summers. He told me, he did not doubt, that in eight years more, he should be able to supply the governor's gardens with sunshine, at a reasonable rate. But he complained that his stock was low, and entreated me to give him something as an encouragement to ingenuity, especially since this had been a very dear season for cucumbers. I made him a small present, for my lord had furnished me with money on purpose, because he knew their practice of begging from all who go to see them. I went into another chamber, but was ready to hasten back, being almost overcome with a horrible stink. My conductor pressed me forward, conjuring me in a whisper, to give no offence, which would be highly resented, and therefore I durst not so much as stop my nose. The projector of this cell was the most ancient student of the academy. His face and beard were of a pale yellow, his hands and clothes dubbed over with filth. When I was presented to him, he gave me a close embrace, a compliment I could well have excused. His employment, from his first coming into the academy, was an operation to reduce human excrement to its original food, by separating the several parts, removing the tincture which it receives from the gall, making the odour exhale, and scumming off the saliva. He had a weekly allowance from the society, of a vessel filled with human orgia, about the bigness of a Bristol barrel. I saw another at work to calcine ice into gunpowder, who likewise showed me a treatise he had written concerning the malleability of fire, which he intended to publish. There was a most ingenious architect, who had contrived a new method for building houses, by beginning at the roof, and working downwards to the foundation, which he justified to me, by like the practice of those two prudent insects, the bee and the spider. There was a man born blind, who had several apprentices in his own condition. Their employment was to mix colours for painters, which their master taught them to distinguish by feeling and smelling. It was indeed my misfortune to find them at that time not very perfect in their lessons, and the professor himself happened to be generally mistaken. This artist is much encouraged and esteemed by the whole fraternity. In another apartment I was highly pleased with a projector who had found a device of ploughing the ground with hogs, to save the charges of ploughs, cattle, and labour. 
The method is this. In an acre of ground you bury at least six inches distance and eight deep a quantity of acorns, dates, chestnuts, and other mast or vegetables, whereof these animals are fondest. Then you drive six hundred or more of them into the field, where, in a few days, they will root up the whole ground in search of their food, and make it fit for sowing, at the same time manuring it with their dung. It is true upon experiment, they found the charge and trouble very great, and they had little or no crop. However, it is not doubted that this invention may be capable of great improvement. I went into another room, where the walls and ceiling were all hung round with cobwebs, except a narrow passage for the artist to go in and out. At my entrance he called to me not to disturb his webs. He lamented the fatal mistake the world had been so long in of using silkworms, while we had such plenty of domestic insects who infinitely excelled the former, because they understood how to weave as well as spin. And he proposed further, that by employing spiders the charge of dyeing silk should be wholly saved, whereof I was fully convinced, when he showed me a vast number of flies most beautifully covered, wherewith he fed his spiders, assuring us that the webs would take a tincture from them, and as he had them of all hues, he hoped to fit everybody's fancy, as soon as he could find proper food for the flies, of certain gums, oils, and other glutinous matter, to give a strength and consistence to the threads. There was an astronomer who had undertaken to place a sundial upon the great weathercock on the townhouse, by adjusting the annual and day annulled motions of the earth and sun, so as to answer and coincide, with all accidental turnings of the wind. I was complaining of a small fit of the colic, upon which my conductor led me into a room where a great physician resided, who was famous for curing that disease, by contrary operations from the same instrument. He had a large pair of bellows, with a long slender muzzle of ivory. This he conveyed eight inches up the anus, and drawing in the wind, he affirmed he could make the guts as lank as a dried bladder. But, when the disease was more stubborn and violent, he let in the muzzle while the bellows were full of wind, which he discharged into the body of the patient, then withdrew the instrument to replenish it, clapping his thumb strongly against the orifice of then fundament, and this being repeated three or four times. The adventitious wind would rush out, bringing the noxious along with it, like water put into a pump, and the patient recovered. I saw him try both experiments upon a dog, but could not discern any effect from the former. After the latter the animal was ready to burst, and made so violent a discharge as was very offensive to me and my companion. The dog died on the spot, and we left the doctor endeavouring to recover him by the same operation. I visited many other apartments, but shall not trouble my reader with all the curiosities I observed, being studious of brevity. I had hitherto seen only one side of the academy, the other being appropriated to the advances of speculative learning, of whom I shall say something, when I have mentioned one illustrious person more, who is called among them the universal artist. He told us, he had been thirty years employing his thoughts for the improvement of human life. He had two large rooms full of wonderful curiosities, and fifty men at work. Some were condensing air into a dry, tangible substance, by extracting the nature, and letting the aqueous or fluid particles percolate, others softening marble for pillows and pincushions, others petrifying the hoofs of a living horse, to preserve them from foundering. The artist himself was at that time busy upon two great designs, the first to sow land with chaff, wherein he affirmed the true seminal virtue to be contained, as he demonstrated by several experiments, which I was not skilful enough to comprehend. The other was, by a certain composition of gums, minerals, and vegetables, outwardly applied to prevent the growth of wool upon two young lambs, and he hoped, in a reasonable time, to propagate the breed of naked sheep all over the kingdom. 
we crossed a walk to the other part of the academy, where, as I have already said, the projectors in speculative learning resided. The first professor I saw was in a very large room, with forty pupils about him. After salutation, observing me to look earnestly upon a frame, which took up the greatest part of both the length and breadth of the room, he said, Perhaps I might wonder to see him employed in a project for improving speculative knowledge by practical and mechanical operations. But the world would soon be sensible of its usefulness, and he flattered himself that a more noble, exalted thought never sprang in any other man's head. Everyone knew how laborious the usual method is of attaining to arts and sciences, whereas, by his contrivance, the most ignorant person, at a reasonable charge, and with a little bodily labour, might write books in philosophy, poetry, politics, laws, mathematics, and theology, without the least assistance from genius or study. He then led me to the frame, about the sides, whereof all his pupils stood in ranks. It was twenty feet square, placed in the middle of the room. The superficies was composed of several bits of wood, about the bigness of a die, but some larger than others. They were all linked together by slender wires. These bits of wood were covered, on every square, with paper pasted on them, and on these papers were written all the words of their language, in their several moods, tenses, and declensions, but without any order. The professor then desired me to observe, for he was going to set his engine at work. The pupils at his command took each of them hold of an iron handle, whereof there were forty fixed round the edges of the frame, and giving them a sudden turn, the holder's position of the words was entirely changed. He then commanded six and thirty of the lads to read the several lines softly as they appeared on the frame and where they found three or four words together that might make part of a sentence, they dictated to the four remaining boys, who were scribes. This work was repeated three or four times, and at every turn the engine was so contrived that the words shifted into new places, as the square bits of wood moved upside down. Six hours a day the young students were employed in this labour, and the professor showed me several volumes in large folio, already collected, of broken sentences, which he intended to piece together, and out of those rich materials, to give the world a complete body of all arts and sciences, which, however, might be still improved, and much expediated, if the public would raise a fund for making and employing five hundred such frames in Lagado, and oblige the managers to contribute in common their several collections. He assured me that this invention had employed all his thoughts from his youth, and that he emptied the whole vocabulary into his frame, and made the strictest computation of the general proportion there is in books between the numbers of particles, nouns, and verbs, and other parts of speech. I made my humblest acknowledgment to this illustrious person for his great communicativeness, and promised if ever I had the good fortune to return to my native country, that I would do him justice, as the sole inventor of this wonderful machine, the form and contrivance of which I desired to delineate on paper, as in the figure here annexed. I told him, although it were the custom of our learned in Europe to steal inventions from each other, who had thereby at least this advantage, that it became a controversy which was the right owner, yet I would take such caution that he should have the honour entire without a rival. We next went to the School of Languages, where three professors sat in consultation upon improving that of their own country. The first project was to shorten discourse by cutting polysyllables into one, and leaving out verbs and participles, because, in reality, all things imaginable are but norms. The other project was a scheme for entirely abolishing all words whatsoever, and was urged as a great advantage in point of health as well as brevity. For it is plain that every word we speak is, in some degree, a diminution of our lunge by corrosion, and consequently contributes to the shortening of our lives. 
an expedient was therefore offered, that since words are only names for things, it would be more convenient for all men to carry about them such things as were necessary to express a particular business they are to discourse on, and this invention would certainly have taken place, to the great ease as well as health of the subject, if the women, in conjunction with the vulgar and illiterate, had not threatened to raise a rebellion, unless they might be allowed the liberty to speak with their tongues, after the manner of their forefathers. Such constant, irreconcilable enemies to science are the common people. However, many of the most learned and wise adhere to the new scheme of expressing themselves by things, which is only this inconvenience attending it, that if a man's business be very great, and of various kinds, he must be obliged, in proportion, to carry a greater bundle of things upon his back, unless he can afford one or two strong servants to attend him. I have often beheld two of those sages almost sinking under the weight of their packs, like peddlers among us, who, when they meet in the street, would lay down their loaths, open their sacks, and hold conversation for an hour together, then put up their implements, help each other to resume their burdens, and take their leave. But for short conversations, a man may carry implements in his pockets, and under his arms, enough to supply him, and in his house he cannot be at a loss. Therefore, the room where company meet who practice this art is full of all things, ready at hand, requisite to furnish matter for this kind of artificial converse. Another great advantage proposed by this invention was that it would serve as a universal language to be understood in all civilized nations, whose goods and utensils are generally of the same kind, or nearly resembling so that their uses might easily be comprehended. And thus ambassadors would be qualified to treat with foreign princes, or ministers of state, to whose tongues they were utter strangers. I was at the mathematical school, where the master taught his pupils after the method scarce imaginable to us in Europe. The proposition and demonstration were fairly written on a thin wafer, with ink composed of a cephalic tincture. This the student was to swallow upon a fasting stomach, and for three days following eat nothing but bread and water. As the wafer digested, the tincture mounted to his brain, bearing the proposition along with it. But the success has not hitherto been answerable. Partly by some error in the quantum, or composition, and partly by the perverseness of lads, to whom this bolus is so nauseous, that they generally steal aside, and discharge it upwards, before it can operate. Neither have they yet been persuaded to use so long an abstinence as the prescription requires. End of Part 3, Chapter 5 Part 3, Chapter 6 of Gulliver's Travels This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift Part 3 A Voyage to Laputa, Balnabarbi, Lugnag, Glubdubdrib, and Japan Chapter 6 A Further Account of the Academy The author proposes some improvements, which are honourably received. In the school of political projectors, I was but ill entertained, the professors appearing, in my judgment, wholly out of their senses, which is a scene that never fails to make me melancholy. These unhappy people were proposing schemes for persuading monarchs to choose favourites upon the score of their wisdom, capacity, and virtue, of teaching ministers to consult the public good, of rewarding merit, great abilities, eminent services of instructing princes to know their true interest by placing it on the same foundation with that of their people, of choosing for employments persons qualified to exercise them, with many other wild, impossible chimeras, that never entered before into the heart of men to conceive, and confirmed in me the old observation, that there is nothing so extravagant and irrational which some philosophers have not maintained for truth. 
but however i shall so far do justice to this part of the academy as to acknowledge that all of them were not so visionary there was a most ingenious doctor who seemed to be perfectly versed in the whole nature and system of government this illustrious person had very usefully employed his studies in finding out effectual remedies for all diseases and corruptions to which the several kinds of public administration are subject by the vices or infirmities of those who govern as well as by the licentiousness of those who are to obey for instance whereas all writers and reasoners have agreed that there is a strict universal resemblance between the natural and the political body can there be anything more evident than that the health of both must be preserved and the disease is cured by the same prescriptions it is allowed that senates and great councils are often troubled with redundant ebullient and other piquant humours with many diseases of the head and more of the heart with strong convulsions with grievous contractions of the nerves and sinews in both hands but especially the right with spleen flatus vertigos and delirians with scrofulous tumours full of fetid purulent matter with sour frothy rectations with canine appetites and crudeness of digestion besides many others needless to mention this doctor therefore proposed that upon the meeting of the senate certain physicians should attend it the three first days of their sitting and at the close of each day's debate feel the pulses of every senator after which having maturely considered and consulted upon the nature of the several maladies and the methods of cure they should on the fourth day return to the senate house attended by their apothecaries stored with proper medicines and before the members sat administer to each of them lenatives operatives abstersives corrosives restringents palliatives laxatives cephalagics icterics apophlegmatics acoustics as their several cases required and according as these medicines should operate repeat alter or omit them at the next meeting this project could not be of any great expense to the public and might in my poor opinion be of much use for the dispatch of business in those countries where senates have any share in the legislative power beget unanimity shorten debates open a few mouths which are now closed and close many more which are now open curb the petulance of the young and correct the positiveness of the old rouse the stupid and damp the pert again because it is a general complaint that the favourites of princes are troubled with short and weak memories the same doctor proposed that whoever attended a first minister after having told his business with the utmost brevity and in the plainest words should at his departure give the said minister a tweak by the nose or a kick in the belly or tread on his corns or lug him thrice by both ears or run a pin into his breech or pinch his arms black and blue to prevent forgetfulness and at every levy day repeat the same operation till the business were done or absolutely refused he likewise directed that every senator in the great council of a nation after he had delivered his opinion and argued in the defence of it should be obliged to give his vote direct contrary because if that were done the result would infallibly terminate in the good of the public when parties in a state are violent he offered a wonderful contrivance to reconcile them the method is this you take a hundred leaders of each party you dispose them into couples of such whose heads are nearest of a size then let two nice operators saw off the occupant of each couple at the same time in such a manner that the brain may be equally divided let the occupants thus cut off be interchanged applying each to the head of his opposite party member it seems indeed to be a work that requires some exactness but the professor assured us that if it were dexterously performed the cure would be infallible for he argued thus that the two brains being left to debate the matter between themselves within the space of one skull would soon come to a good understanding and produce that moderation 
as well as regularity of thinking, so much to be wished for in the heads of those who imagine they come into the world only to watch and govern its motion. And as to the difference of brains, in quantity or quality, among those who are directors in faction, the doctor assured us, from his own knowledge, that it was a perfect trifle. I heard a very warm debate between two professors, about the most commodious and effectual ways and means of raising money without grieving the subject. The first affirmed, the justest method would be to lay a certain tax upon vices and follies, and the sum fixed upon every man to be rated, after the fairest manner, by a jury of his neighbours. The second was of an opinion directly contrary. To tax those qualities of body and mind, for which men chiefly value themselves, the rate to be more or less according to the degrees of excelling, the decision whereof should be left entirely to their own breast. The highest tax was upon men who are the great favourites of the other sex, and the assessments, according to the number and nature of the favours they have received, for which they are allowed to be their own vouchers. Wit, valour, and politeness were likewise proposed to be largely taxed, and collected in the same manner, by every person's giving his own word for the quantum of what he possessed. But as to honour, justice, wisdom, and learning, they should not be taxed at all, because they are qualifications of so singular a kind, that no man will either allow them in his neighbour, or value them in himself. The women were proposed to be taxed according to their beauty and skill in dressing, wherein they had the same privilege with the men, to be determined by their own judgment. But constancy, chastity, good sense, and good nature were not rated, because they would not bear the charge of collecting. To keep senators in the interest of the crown, it was proposed that the members should raffle for employment, every man first taking an oath, and giving security, that he would vote for the court, whether he won or not. After which, the losers had, in their turn, the liberty of raffling upon the next vacancy. Thus hope and expectation would be kept alive, none would complain of broken promises, but impute their disappointments wholly to fortune, whose shoulders are broader and stronger than those of a ministry. Another professor showed me a large paper of instructions for discovering plots and conspiracies against the government. He advised great statesmen to examine into the diet of all suspected persons, their times of eating, upon which side they lay in bed, with which hand they wipe their posteriors, take a strict view of their excrements, and from the colour, the odour, the taste, the consistence, the crudeness or maturity of digestion, form a judgment of their thoughts and designs, because men are never so serious, thoughtful and intent as when they are at stool, which he found by frequent experiment. For in such conjectures, which he used, merely as a trial, to consider which was the best way of murdering the king, his orger would have a tincture of green, but quite different when he thought only of raising an insurrection, or burning the metropolis. The whole discourse was written with great acuteness, containing many observations, both curious and useful for politicians. But, as I conceived, not altogether complete. This I ventured to tell the author, and offered, if he pleased, to supply him with some additions. He received my proposition with more compliance than is usual among writers, especially those of the projecting species, professing he would be glad to receive further information. I told him that in the kingdom of Tribnia, by the natives called Langdon, where I had sojourned some time in my travels, the bulk of the people consist in a manner wholly of discoverers, witnesses, informers, accusers, prosecutors, evidences, swearers, together with the several subservient and subaltern instruments, all under the colours, the conduct, and the pay of ministers of state and their deputies. The plots, in that kingdom, are usually the workmanship of those persons who desire to raise their own characters of profound politicians, to restore new vigour to a crazy administration, to stifle or divert general discontents, 
to fill their coffers with forfeitures, and raise or sink the opinion of public credit, as either shall best answer their private advantage. It is first agreed and settled among them, what suspected person shall be accused of a plot. Then effectual care is taken to secure all their letters and papers, and put the owners in chains. These papers are delivered to a set of artists, very dexterous in finding out the mysterious meanings of words, syllables, and letters. For instance, they can discover a close stool, to signify a privy council, a flock of geese a senate, a lame dog an invader, the plague a standing army, a buzzard a prime minister, the gout a high priest, a gibbet a secretary of state, a chamber pot a committee of grandees, a sieve a court lady, a broom a revolution, a mousetrap an employment, a bottomless pit a treasury, a sink a court, a cap and bells a favourite, a broken reed a court of justice, an empty tun a general, a running saw the administration. When this method fails, they have two others more effectual, which the learned among them call them acrostics and anagrams. First, they can decipher all initial letters into political meanings. Thus N shall signify a plot, B a regiment of horse, L a fleet at sea. Or secondly, by transposing the letters of the alphabet in any suspected paper, they can lay open the deepest designs of a discontented party. So, for example, if I should say in a letter to a friend, Our brother Tom has just got the piles, a skilful decipherer would discover that the same letters which composed that sentence may be analysed into the following words. Resist, a plot is brought home, the tour, and this is the anagrammatic method. The professor made me great acknowledgments for communicating these observations, and promised to make honourable mention of me in his treatise. I saw nothing in this country that could invite me to a longer continuance, and began to think of returning home to England. End of Part 3 Chapter 6 Part 3 Chapter 7 of Gulliver's Travels this is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part 3. A Voyage to Laputa, Balnibarbi, Lugnag, Glubdub Drib, and Japan. Chapter 7. The author leaves Lagado, arrives at Maldonada, no ship ready. He takes a short voyage to Glubdub Drib. His reception by the governor. The continent, of which this kingdom is a part, extends itself, as I have reason to believe, eastward, to that unknown tract of America, westward of California, and north to the Pacific Ocean, which is not above a hundred and fifty miles from Lagado, where there is a good port and much commerce with the great island of Lugnag, situated to the north-west, about twenty-nine degrees north latitude, and a hundred and forty longitude. This island of Lugnag stands south-eastward of Japan, about a hundred leagues distant. There is a strict alliance between the Japanese emperor and the king of Lugnag, which affords frequent opportunities of sailing from one island to the other. I determined, therefore, to direct my course this way, in order to my return to Europe. I hired two mules with a guide to show me the way, and carry my small baggage. I took leave of my noble protector, who had shown me so much favour, and made me a generous present at my departure. My journey was without any accident or adventure worth relating. When I arrived at the port of Maldonada, for so it is called, there was no ship in the harbour bound for Lugnag, nor likely to be in some time. The town is about as large as Portsmouth. I soon fell into some acquaintance, and was very hospitably received. A gentleman of distinction said to me, that since the ships bound for Lugnag could not be ready in less than a month, it might not be disagreeable amusement for me to take a trip to the little island of Glubdubdrib, about five leagues off to the south-west. 
he offered himself and a friend to accompany me, and that I should be provided with a small convenient bark for the voyage. Glub dub drib, as nearly as I can interpret the word, signifies the island of sorcerers or magicians. It is about one third as large as the Isle of Wight, and extremely fruitful. It is governed by the head of a certain tribe who are all magicians. This tribe marries only among each other, and the eldest in succession is prince or governor. He has a noble palace and a park of about three thousand acres, surrounded by a wall of hewn stone twenty feet high. In this park are several small enclosures for cattle, corn, and gardening. The governor and his family are served and attended by domestics of a kind somewhat unusual. By his skill in necromancy, he has a power of calling whom he pleases from the dead, and commanding their service for twenty-four hours, but no longer. Nor can he call the same persons up again in less than three months, except upon very extraordinary occasions. When we arrived at the island, which was about eleven in the morning, one of the gentlemen who accompanied me went to the governor, and desired admittance for a stranger, who came on purpose to have the honour of attending on his highness. This was immediately granted, and we all three entered the gate of the palace between two rows of guards, armed and dressed in a very antic manner, and with something in their countenances that made my flesh creep with a horror I cannot express. We passed through several apartments, between servants of the same sort, ranked on each side as before, till we came to the chamber of presence, where, after three profound obsciences, and a few general questions, we were permitted to sit on three stools, near the lowest step of his highness's throne. He understood the language of Baunibarbi, although it was different from that of this island. He desired me to give him some account of my travels, and to let me see that I should be treated without ceremony. He dismissed all his attendants with a turn of his finger, at which, to my great astonishment, they vanished in an instant, like visions in a dream when we awake on a sudden. I could not recover myself in some time, till the governor assured me that I should receive no hurt and observing my two companions to be under no concern, who had been often entertained in the same manner, I began to take courage, and related to his highness a short history of my several adventures, yet not without some hesitation, and frequently looking behind me to the place where I had seen those domestic spectres. I had the honour to dine with the governor, where a new set of ghosts served up the meat, and waited at table. I now observed myself to be less terrified than I had been in the morning. I stayed till sunset, but humbly desired His Highness to excuse me for not accepting his invitation of lodging in the palace. My two friends and I lay at a private house in the town adjoining, which is the capital of this little island, and the next morning we returned to pay our duty to the governor, as he was pleased to command us. After this manner we continued in the island for ten days, most part of every day with the governor, and at night in our lodging. I soon grew so familiarized to the sight of spirits, that after the third or fourth time they gave me no emotion at all, or, if I had any apprehensions left, my curiosity prevailed over them. For his highness, the governor ordered me to call up whatever persons I would choose to name, and in whatever numbers, among all the dead from the beginning of the world to the present time, and command them to answer any questions I should think fit to ask. With this condition that my questions must be confined within the compass of the times they lived in, and one thing I might depend upon, that they would certainly tell me the truth, for lying was a talent of no use in the lower world. I made my humble acknowledgments to His Highness for so great a favour, we were in a chamber, from whence there was a fair prospect into the park, and because my first inclination was to be entertained with scenes of pomp and magnificence, I desired to see Alexander the Great at the head of his army, just after the Battle of Arbela, which, upon a motion of the governor's finger, immediately appeared in a large field, 
under the window where we stood. Alexander was called up into the room. It was with great difficulty that I understood his Greek, and had but little of my own. He assured me upon his honour that he was not poisoned, but died of a bad fever by excessive drinking. Next I saw Hannibal passing the Alps, who told me he had not a drop of vinegar in his camp. I saw Caesar and Pompey at the head of their troops, just ready to emerge. I saw the former in his last great triumph. I desired that the Senate of Rome might appear before me in one large chamber, and an assembly of somewhat a later age in counterview in another. The first seemed to be an assembly of heroes and demigods. The other, a knot of peddlers, pickpockets, highwaymen, and bullies. The governor, at my request, gave the sign for Caesar and Brutus to advance towards us. I was struck with a profound veneration at the sight of Brutus, and could easily discover the most consummate virtue, the greatest intrepidity and firmness of mind, the truest love of his country, and general benevolence for mankind, in every lineament of his countenance. I observed, with much pleasure, that these two persons were in good intelligence with each other, and Caesar freely confessed to me, that the greatest actions of his own life were not equal, by many degrees, to the glory of taking it away. I had the honour to have much conversation with Brutus, that his ancestor Junius, Socrates, Ipamanundus, Cato the Younger, Sir Thomas More, and himself, were perpetually together, a sextumvirate, to which all the ages of the world cannot add a seventh. It would be tedious to trouble the reader with relating what vast numbers of illustrious persons were called up, to gratify that insatiable desire I had to see the world in every period of antiquity placed before me. I chiefly fed mine eyes with beholding the destroyers of tyrants and usurpers, and the restorers of liberty to oppressed and injured nations. But it is impossible to express the satisfaction I received in my own mind, after such a manner as to make it a suitable entertainment to the reader. End of Part 3 Chapter 7《Part Three, Chapter Eight of Gulliver's Travels》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part Three: A Voyage to Laputa, Barnibarbi, Lugnag, Glubdubdrib, and Japan. Chapter Eight. A further account of Glubdub Drib, ancient and modern history corrected. Having a desire to see those ancients who were most renowned for wit and learning, I set apart one day on purpose. I proposed that Homer and Aristotle might appear at the head of all their commentators, but these were so numerous that some hundreds were forced to attend in the court and outward rooms of the palace. I knew, and could distinguish those two heroes at first sight, not only from the crowd, but from each other. Homer was the taller and comelier person of the two, walked very erect for one of his age, and his eyes were the most quick and piercing I ever beheld. Aristotle stooped much, and made use of a staff. His visage was meagre, his hair lank and thin, and his voice hollow. I soon discovered that both of them were perfect strangers to the rest of the company, and had never seen or heard of them before, and I had a whisper from a ghost, who shall be nameless, that these commentators always kept in the most distinct quarters from their principles in the lower world, through a consciousness of shame and guilt, because they had so horribly misinterpreted the meaning of those authors to posterity. I introduced Didymus and Eustathemus to Homer, and prevailed on him to treat them better than perhaps they deserved, for he soon found they wanted a genius to enter into the spirit of a poet. But Aristotle was out of all patience with the account I gave him of Scotus and Ramus, as I presented them to him, and he asked them, 
whether the rest of the tribe were as great a dunces as themselves. I then desired the governor to call up Descartes and Gassendi, with whom I prevailed to explain their systems to Aristotle. This great philosopher freely acknowledged his own mistake in natural philosophy, because he proceeded in many things upon conjecture, as all men must do, and he found that Cassendi, who had made the doctrine of Epicurus as palatable as he could, and the vortices of Descartes, were equally to be exploded. He predicted the same fate to attraction, whereof the present learned are such zealous asserters. He said, that new systems of nature were but new-fashioned, which would vary in every age, and even those who pretend to demonstrate them from mathematical principles, would flourish but a short period of time, and be out of vogue when that was determined. I spent five days in conversing with many others of the ancient learned. I saw most of the first Roman emperors. I prevailed on the governor to call up Heliogabalus's cooks to dress us the dinner, but they could not show us much of their skill for want of materials. A helot of Agesilaus made us a dish of Spartan broth, but I was not able to get down a second spoonful. The two gentlemen who conducted me to the island were pressed by their private affairs to return in three days, which I employed in seeing some of the modern dead, who had made the greatest figure for two or three hundred years past in our own and other countries of Europe and, having been always a great admirer of old, illustrious families, I desired the governor would call up a dozen or two of kings, with their ancestors in order for eight or nine generations. But my disappointment was grievous and unexpected, for, instead of a long train with royal diadems, I saw in one family two fiddlers, three spruce courtiers, and an Italian prelate. In another, a barber, an abbot, and two cardinals. I have too great a veneration for crowned heads to dwell any longer on so nice a subject. But as to counts, marquises, dukes, earls, and the like, I was not so scrupulous. And I confess, it was not without some pleasure that I found myself able to trace the peculiar features by which certain families are distinguished up to their originals. I could plainly discover whence one family derives a long chin, why a second has abounded with knaves for two generations, and fools for two more, why a third happened to be crack-brained, and a fourth to be sharpers. Whence it came, what Polydor Virgil says of a certain great house, Nec via fortis, nec formina casta, how cruelty, falsehood, and cowardice, grew to be characteristics by which certain families are distinguished as much as by their coat of arms, who first brought the pox into a noble house, which has linearly descended scrofulous tumours to their posterity. Neither could I wonder at all this, when I saw such an interruption of lineages, by pages, lackeys, valets, coachmen, gamesters, fiddlers, players, captains, and pickpockets. I was chiefly disgusted with modern history, for having strictly examined all the persons of greatest name in the courts of princes, for a hundred years past, I found how the world had been misled by prostitute writers, to ascribe the greatest exploits in war to cowards, the wisest counsel to fools, sincerity to flatterers, Roman virtue to betrayers of their country, piety to atheists, chastity to sodomites, truth to informers. How many innocent and excellent persons had been condemned to death or banishment by the practising of great ministers upon the corruption of judges and the malice of factions. How many villains had been exalted to the highest places of trust, power, dignity and profit. How great a share in the motions and events of courts, councils and senates might be challenged by bawds, whores, pimps, parasites, and buffoons. How low an opinion I had of human wisdom and integrity, when I was truly informed of the springs and motives of great enterprises and revolutions in the world, and of the contemptible accidents to which they owed their success. 
Here I discovered the roguery and ignorance of those who pretended to write anecdotes, or secret history, who send so many kings to their graves with a cup of poison. We'll repeat the discourse between a prince and chief minister, where no witness was by, unlock the thoughts and cabinets of ambassadors and secretaries of state, and have the perpetual misfortune to be mistaken. Here I discovered the true cause of many great events that have surprised the world. How a whore can govern the backstairs, the backstairs a council, and the council a senate. A general confessed in my presence that he got a victory purely by the force of cowardice and ill-conduct, and an admiral that, for want of proper intelligence, he beat the enemy, to whom he intended to betray the fleet. Three kings protested to me, that in their whole reigns they never did once prefer any person of merit, unless by mistake, or treachery of some minister in whom they confided, neither would they do it if they were to live again. And they showed, with great strength of reason, that the royal throne could not be supported without corruption, because that positive, confident, restive temper, which virtue infused into a man, was a perpetual clog to public business. I had the curiosity to inquire, in a particular manner, by which methods great numbers had procured to themselves high titles of honour and prodigious estates, and I confined my inquiry to a very modern period. However, without grating upon present times, because I would be sure to give no offence even to foreigners. For I hope the reader need not be told that I do not in the least intend my own country in what I say upon this occasion. A great number of persons concerned were called up, and, upon a very slight examination, discovered such a scene of infamy that I cannot reflect upon it without some seriousness. Perjury, oppression, subornation, fraud, panderism, and the like infirmities, were among the most excusable arts they had to mention. And for these I gave, as it was reasonable, great allowance. But when some confessed they owed their greatness and wealth to sodomy or incest, others to the prostituting of their own wives and daughters, others to the betraying of their country or their prince, some to poisoning, more to the perverting of justice in order to destroy the innocent, I hope I may be pardoned if these discoveries inclined me a little to abate of that profound veneration, which I am naturally apt to pay to persons of high rank, who ought to be treated with the utmost respect due to their sublime dignity by us their inferiors. I had often read of some great services done to princes and states, and desired to see the persons by whom those services were performed. Upon inquiry, I was told that their names were to be found on no record, except a few of them, whom the history has represented as the vilest of rogues and traitors. As to the rest, I had never once heard of them. They all appeared with dejected looks, and in the meanest habit, most of them telling me they died in poverty and disgrace, and the rest on a scaffold or gibbet. Among others, there was one person whose case appeared a little singular. He had a youth about eighteen years old standing by his side, he told me he had for many years been commander of a ship, and in a sea-fight at Actium had the good fortune to break through the enemy's great line of battle, sink three of their capital ships, and take a fourth, which was the sole cause of Antony's flight, and of the victory that ensued. That the youth standing by him, his only son, was killed in the action. He added, that upon the confidence of some merit, the war being at an end, he went to Rome, and solicited at the court of Augustus, to be preferred to a greater ship, whose commander had been killed. But, without any regard to his pretensions, it was given to a boy who had never seen the sea, the son of Libertina, who waited on one of the emperor's mistresses. Returning back to his own vessel, he was charged with neglect of duty, and the ship given to a favourite page of Publicola, the vice-admiral, whereupon he retired to a poor farm at a great distance from Rome, and there ended his life. I was so curious to know the truth of this story, that I desired Agrippa might be called, who was admiral in that fight. 
he appeared and confirmed the whole account, but with much more advantage to the captain, whose modesty had extenuated or concealed a great part of his merit. I was surprised to find corruption grown so high and so quick in that empire, by the force of luxury so lately introduced, which made me less wonder at many parallel cases in other countries, where vices of all kinds have reigned so much longer, and where the whole praise, as well as pillage, has been engrossed by the chief commander, who perhaps had the least title to either. As every person called up made exactly the same appearance he had done in the world, it gave me melancholy reflections to observe how much of the race of humankind was degenerated among us within these hundred years past, how the pox, under all its consequences and denominations, had altered every lineament of an English countenance, shortened the size of bodies, unbraced the nerves, relaxed the sinews and muscles, introduced a sallow complexion, and rendered the flesh loose and rancid. I descended so low as to desire some English yeoman of the old stamp might be summoned to appear, once so famous for the simplicity of their manners, diet, and dress, for justice in their dealings, for their true spirit of liberty, for their valour and love of their country. Neither could I be wholly unmoved, after comparing the living with the dead, when I considered how these pure native virtues were prostituted for a piece of money by their grandchildren, who, in selling their votes and managing at elections, have acquired every vice and corruption that can possibly be learned in a court. End of Part 3 Chapter 8 Part 3 Chapter 9 of Gulliver's Travels This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Lizzie Driver Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift Part 3 A Voyage to Laputa, Balnibarbi, Lognag, Glubdubdrib, and Japan Chapter 9 The author returns to Maladonada, sails to the kingdom of Lugnag. The author confined. He is sent for to court, the manner of his admittance. The king's great lenity to his subjects. The day of our departure being come, I took leave of his highness, the governor of Glubdubdrib, and returned with my two companions to Melodonada, where, after a fortnight's waiting, a ship was ready to sail for Lugnag. The two gentlemen and some others were so generous and kind as to furnish me with provisions and see me on board. I was a month in this voyage. We had one violent storm, and were under a necessity of steering westward to get into the trade wind, which holds for above sixty leagues. On the 21st of April, 1708, we sailed into the river of Klimignig, which is a seaport town, at the south-east point of Lugnag. We cast anchor within a league of the town, and made a signal for a pilot. Two of them came on board in less than half an hour by whom we were guided between certain shoals and rocks, which are very dangerous in the passage to a large basin, where a fleet may ride in safety within a cable's length of the town wall. Some of our sailors, whether out of treachery or inadvertence, had informed the pilots that I was a stranger and great traveller, whereof these gave notice to a custom-house officer, by whom I was examined very strictly upon my landing. This officer spoke to me in the language of Balnibarbi, which, by the force of much commerce, is generally understood in that town, especially by seamen and those employed in the customs. I gave him a short account of some particulars, and made my story as plausible and consistent as I could. But I thought it necessary to disguise my country, and call myself a Hollander, because my intentions were for Japan, and I knew the Dutch were the only Europeans permitted to enter into that kingdom. I therefore told the officer, that having been shipwrecked on the coast of Balnibarbi and cast on a rock, I was received into Laputa, or the Flying Island, of which he had often heard, and was now endeavouring to get to Japan, whence I might find a convenience of returning to my own country. 
the officer said, I must be confined till he could receive orders from court, for which he would write immediately, and hope to receive an answer in a fortnight. I was carried to a convenient lodging, with a sentry placed at the door. However, I had the liberty of a large garden, and was treated with humanity enough, being maintained all the time at the king's charge. I was invited by several persons, chiefly out of curiosity, because it was reported that I came from countries very remote, of which they had never heard. I hired a young man, who came in the same ship, to be an interpreter. He was a native of Lugnag, but had lived some years at Maldonada, and was a perfect master of both languages. By his assistance I was able to hold a conversation with those who came to visit me, but this consisted only of their questions and my answers. The dispatch came from court about the time we expected. It contained a warrant for conducting me and my retinue to Trowl Drag Dub, or Trill Drog Drib, for it is pronounced both ways as near as I can remember, by a party of ten horse. All my retinue was that poor lad for an interpreter, whom I persuaded into my service, and, at my humble request, we had each of us a mule to ride on. A messenger was dispatched half a day's journey before us, to give the king notice of my approach, and to desire that his majesty would please to appoint a day and hour, when it would, by his gracious pleasure, that I might have the honour to lick the dust before his footstool. This is the court style, and I found it to be more than matter of form, for, upon my admittance two days after my arrival, I was commanded to crawl upon my belly, and lick the floor as I advanced. But, on account of my being a stranger, care was taken to have it made so clean that the dust was not offensive. However, this was a peculiar grace, not allowed to any but persons of the highest rank, when they desire an admittance. Nay, sometimes the floor is strewed with dust on purpose, when the person to be admitted happens to have powerful enemies at court. And I have seen a great lord, with his mouth so crammed, that when he had crept to the proper distance from the throne, he was not able to speak a word. Neither is there any remedy, because it is capital for those who receive an audience to spit or wipe their mouths in His Majesty's presence. There is indeed another custom, which I cannot altogether approve of, when the king has a mind to put any of his nobles to death in a gentle, indulgent manner, he commands the floor to be strewed with a certain brown powder of a deadly composition, which, being licked up, infallibly kills him in twenty-four hours. But, in justice to this prince's great clemency, and the care he has of his subjects' lives, wherein it were much to be wished that the monarchs of Europe would imitate him, it must be mentioned for his honour that strict orders are given to have the infected parts of the floor well washed after every such execution, which, if his domestics neglect, they are in danger of incurring his royal displeasure. I myself heard him give directions, that one of his pages should be whipped, whose turn it was to give notice about washing the floor after an execution, but maliciously had omitted it, by which neglect a young lord of great hopes, coming to an audience, was unfortunately poisoned, although the king at the time had no design against his life. But this good prince was so gracious as to forgive the poor page his whipping, upon promise that he would do so no more, without special orders. To return from this digression, when I had crept within four yards of the throne, I raised myself gently upon my knee, and then, striking my forehead seven times against the ground, I pronounced the following words, as they had been taught me the night before. Ink plain gloft throb, squat, serumbly hop, em lashnalt, zwin, tsnod balkifun, tsnod balkif, slinop had, griddlop, asht. This is the compliment, established by the laws of the land, for all persons admitted to the king's presence. It may be rendered into English thus. May your celestial majesty outlive the sun eleven moons and a half. To this the king returned some answer, 
which, although I could not understand, yet I replied, as I had been directed, Fluff drin yalaric, dwaldum prastad merpush, which properly signifies, My tongue is in the mouth of my friend. And by this expression was meant, that I desired leave to bring my interpreter, whereupon the young man already mentioned was accordingly introduced, by whose intervention I answered as many questions as his majesty could put in above an hour. I spoke in the Balnabarbian tongue, and my interpreter delivered my meaning in that of Lugnag. The king was much delighted with my company, and ordered his Bliff Mark Club, or High Chamberlain, to appoint a lodging in the court for me and my interpreter, with a daily allowance for my table, and a large purse of gold for my common expenses. I stayed three months in this country, out of perfect obedience to his majesty, who was pleased highly to favour me, and made me very honourable offers. But I thought it more consistent with prudence and justice, to pass the remainder of my days with my wife and family. End of Part 3 Chapter 9《Chapter 3 Chapter 10 of Gulliver's Travels This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part 3 A Voyage to Laputa, Balnibarbi, Lugnag, Glubdubdrib, and Japan. Chapter 10 the Lugnagians commended a particular description of the Stroldbrugs, with many conversations between the author and some eminent persons upon that subject. The Lugnagians are a polite and generous people, and although they are not without some share of that pride which is peculiar to all eastern countries, yet they show themselves courteous to strangers, especially such who are countenanced by the court. I had many acquaintance, and among persons of the best fashion. And being always attended by my interpreter, the conversation we had was not disagreeable. One day, in much good company, I was asked by a person of quality whether I had seen any of their Stroldbrugs, or immortals. I said I had not, and desired he would explain to me what he meant by such an appellation applied to a mortal creature. He told me, that sometimes, though very rarely, a child happened to be born in a family with a red circular spot on the forehead, directly over the left eyebrow, which was an infallible mark that it should never die. The spot, as he described it, was about the compass of a silver three pence, but in the course of time grew larger and changed its colour, for at twelve years old it became green, so continued till five and twenty, then turned to a deep blue. At five and forty it grew coal-black, and as large as an English shilling, but never omitted any further alteration. He said, these births were so rare, that he did not believe there could be above eleven hundred Stroldbrugs, of both sexes, in the whole kingdom, of which he computed about fifty in the metropolis, and among the rest a young girl born about three years ago. That these productions were not peculiar to any family, but a mere effect of chance. And the children of the Stroldbrugs themselves were equally mortal with the rest of the people. I freely own myself to being struck with inexpressible delight upon hearing this account, and the person who gave it to me happening to understand the Balnabarbian language, which I spoke very well, I could not forbear breaking out into expressions perhaps a little too extravagant. I cried out, as in a rapture, Happy nation, where every child hath at least a chance for being immortal. Happy people, who enjoy so many living examples of ancient virtue, and of masters ready to instruct them in the wisdom of all former ages. But happiest, beyond all comparison, are those excellent Strolbrugs, who, being born exempt from that universal calamity of human nature, have their minds free and disengaged, without the weight and depression of spirits caused by the continual apprehensions of death. I discovered my admiration, that I had not observed any of these illustrious persons at court, the black spot on the forehead being so remarkable a distinction, that I could not have easily overlooked it, and it was impossible that His Majesty, a most judicious prince, 
should not provide himself with a good number of such wise and able counsellors. Yet perhaps the virtue of those reverend sages was too far strict for the corrupt and libertine manners of a court, and we often find by experience that young men are too opinionated and volatile to be guided by the sober dictates of their seniors. However, since the king was pleased to allow me access to his royal person, I was resolved, upon the very first occasion, to deliver my opinion to him on this matter freely and at large, by the help of my interpreter, and whether he would be pleased to take my advice or not. Yet in one thing I was determined, that his majesty, having frequently offered me an establishment in this country, I would, with great thankfulness, accept the favour, and pass my life here in the conversation of these superior beings, the Straldbrugs, if they were pleased to admit me. The gentleman to whom I addressed my discourse, because, as I have already observed, he spoke the language of Barnabarbi, said to me, with a sort of smile which usually arises from pity to the ignorant, that he was glad of any occasion to keep me among them, and desired my permission to explain to the company what I had spoke. He did so, and they talked together for some time in their own language, whereof I understood not a syllable, neither could I observe by their countenances what impression my discourse had made on them. After a short silence, the same person told me that his friends and mine, so he thought fit to express himself, were very much pleased with the judicious remarks I had made on the great happiness and advantages of immortal life and they were desirous to know, in a particular manner, what scheme of living I should have formed to myself, if it had fallen to my lot to have been born a Straldbrug. I answered, it was easy to be eloquent on so copious and delightful a subject, especially to me, who had been often apt to amuse myself with visions of what I should do, if I were a king, a general, or a great lord, and upon this very case, I had frequently run over the whole system, how I should employ myself and pass the time, if I were sure to live for ever. That, if it had been my good fortune to come into the world a Straldbrug, as soon as I could discover my own happiness, by understanding the difference between life and death, I would first resolve, by all arts and methods, whatsoever to procure myself riches. In the pursuit of which, by thrift and management, I might reasonably expect, in about two hundred years, to be the wealthiest man in the kingdom. In the second place I would, from my earliest youth, apply myself to the study of arts and sciences, by which I should arrive in time to excel all others in learning. Lastly, I would carefully record every action and event of consequence that happened in the public, impartially draw the characters of the several successions of princes and great ministers of state, with my own observations on every point. I would exactly set down the several changes in customs, language, fashion of dress, diet and diversions, by all which acquirements I should be a living treasure of knowledge and wisdom, and certainly become the oracle of the nations. I would never marry after three score, but live in a hospitable manner, yet still on the saving side. I would entertain myself in forming and directing the minds of hopeful young men, by convincing them, from my own remembrance, experience, and observation, fortified by numerous examples, of the usefulness of virtue in public and private life. But my choice and constant companions should be a set of my own immortal brotherhood, among whom I would elect a dozen from the most ancient down to my own contemporaries. Where any of these wanted fortunes, I would provide them with convenient lodges round my own estate and have some of them always at my table, only mingling a few of the most valuable among you mortals, whom length of time would harden me to lose with little or no reluctance, and treat your posterity after the same manner, just as a man diverts himself with the annual succession of pinks and tulips in his garden, without regretting the loss of those which withered the preceding year. These Straldbrugs and I, would mutually communicate our observations and memorials through the course of time, remark the several gradations by which corruption steals into the world, 
and opposed it in every step by giving perpetual warning and instruction to mankind, which, added to the strong influence of our own example, would probably prevent that continual degeneracy of human nature so justly complained of in all ages. Add to this the pleasure of seeing the various revolutions of states and empires, the changes in the lower and upper worlds, ancient cities in ruins, and obscure villages becoming the seats of kings, famous rivers lessening into shallow brooks, the ocean leaving one coast dry and overwhelming another, the discovery of many countries yet unknown, barbarity overrunning the politest nations, and the most barbarous becoming civilized. I should then see the discovery of the longitude, the perpetual motion, the universal medicine, and many other great inventions brought to the utmost perfection. What wonderful discovery should we make in astronomy, by outliving and confirming our own predictions, by observing the progress and return of comets, with the changes of motion in the sun, moon, and stars? I enlarged upon many other topics, with the natural desire of endless life, and sublunary happiness, could easily furnish me with. When I had ended, and the sum of my discourse had been interpreted, as before to the rest of the company, there was a good deal of talk among them in the language of the country, not without some laughter at my expense. At last, the same gentleman who had been my interpreter said, he was desired by the rest to set me right in a few mistakes, which I had fallen into through the common imbecility of human nature, and upon that allowance was less answerable for them. That this breed of Streldbrugs was peculiar to their country, for there were no such people in Balnabarbi or Japan, where he had the honour to be ambassador for his majesty, and found the natives in both those kingdoms very hard to believe that the fact was possible. And it appeared from my astonishment when he first mentioned the matter to me, that I received it as a thing wholly new, and scarcely to be credited. That in the two kingdoms above mentioned, where, during his residence, he had conversed very much, he observed long life to be the universal desire and wish of mankind. That whoever had one foot in the grave was sure to hold back the other as strongly as he could. That the oldest had still hopes of living one day longer, and looked on death as the greatest evil, from which nature always prompted him to retreat. Only in this island of Lugnag, the appetite for living was not so eager, from the continual example of the Stroldbrugs before their eyes. That the system of living contrived by me was unreasonable and unjust, because it supposed a perpetuity of youth, health, and vigour, which no man could be so foolish to hope, however extravagant he may be in his wishes. That the question therefore was not, whether a man would choose to be always in the prime of youth, attended with prosperity and health, but how he would pass a perpetual life under all the usual disadvantages which old age brings along with it. For although few men will avow their desires of being immortal upon such hard conditions, yet in the two kingdoms before mentioned, of Balnibarbi and Japan, he observed that every man desired to put off death sometimes longer, let it approach ever so late, and he rarely heard of any man who died willingly, except he were incited by the extremity of grief or torture. And he appealed to me, whether in those countries I had travelled, as well as my own, I had not observed the same general disposition. After this preface, he gave me a particular account of the Stroldbrugs among them. He said, They commonly acted like mortals till about thirty years old. After which, by degrees, they grew melancholy and dejected, increasing in both till they came to fourscore. This he learned from their own confession, for otherwise there not being above two or three of that species born in the same age, there were too few to form a general observation by. When they came to fourscore years, which is reckoned the extremity of living in this country, they had not only all the follies and infirmities of other old men, but many more which arose from the dreadful prospect of never dying. They were not only opinionative, peevish, covetous, morose, vain, talkative, but incapable of friendship, and dead to all natural affection, which never descended below their grandchildren. 
envy and impotent desires are their prevailing passions. But those objects against which their envy seems principally directed are the vices of the younger sort and the deaths of the old. By reflecting on the former, they find themselves cut off from all possibility of pleasure, and whenever they see a funeral, they lament and repine that others have gone to a harbour of rest to which they themselves can never hope to arrive. They have no remembrance of anything but what they learned and observed in their youth and middle age, and even this is very imperfect. And for the truth of particulars of any fact, it is safer to depend on common tradition than upon their best recollections. The least miserable among them appear to be those who turn to dotage, and entirely lose their memories. These meet with more pity and assistance, because they want many bad qualities which abound in others. If a Strasbourg happened to marry one of his own kind, the marriage is dissolved, of course, by the courtesy of the kingdom, as soon as the younger of the two comes to be fourscore. For the law thinks it a reasonable indulgence, that those who are condemned, without any fault of their own, to a perpetual continuance in the world, should not have the misery doubled by the load of a wife. As soon as they have completed the term of eighty years, they are looked on as dead in law, their heirs immediately succeeded to their estates. Only a small pittance is reserved for their support, and the poor ones are maintained at the public charge. After that period they are held incapable of any employment of trust or profit. They cannot purchase lands or take leases. Neither are they allowed to be witnesses in any cause, either civil or criminal, not even for the decision of mears and bounds. At ninety they lose their teeth and hair. They have at that age no distinction of taste but eat and drink whatever they can get, without relish or appetite. The diseases they were subject to still continue, without increasing or diminishing. In talking, they forget the common appellation of things and the names of persons, even those who are their nearest friends and relations. For the same reason they can never amuse themselves with reading, because their memory will not serve to carry them from the beginning of a sentence to the end, and by this defect they are deprived of the only entertainment whereof they might otherwise be capable. The language of this country being always upon the flux, the Strasbourgs of one age do not understand those of another, neither are they able, after two hundred years, to hold any conversation, farther than by a few general words, with their neighbours the mortals, and thus they lie under the disadvantage of living like foreigners in their own country. This was the account given me of the Strasbourgs, as near as I can remember. I afterwards saw five or six of different ages, the youngest not above two hundred years old, who were brought to me at several times by some of my friends. But, although they were told that I was a great traveller, and had seen all the world, they had not the least curiosity to ask me a question. Only desired, I would give them slumskudask, or a token of remembrance, which is a modest way of begging to avoid the law that strictly forbids it, because they are provided for by the public, although indeed with a very scanty allowance. They are despised and hated by all sorts of people. When one of them is born it is reckoned ominous, and their birth is recorded very particularly so that you may know their age by consulting the register, which, however, has not been kept above a thousand years past or at least has been destroyed by time or public disturbances. But the usual way of computing how old they are is by asking them what kings or great persons they can remember, and then consulting history, for infallibly the last prince in their mind did not begin his reign after they were fourscore years old. They were the most mortifying sight I ever beheld, and the women more horrible than the men. Besides the usual deformities in extreme old age, they acquired an additional ghastliness, in proportion to their number of years, which is not to be described, and among half a dozen I soon distinguished which was the eldest, although there was not above a century or two between them. The reader will easily believe that from what I had heard and seen, my keen appetite for perpetuity of life was much abated. I grew heartily ashamed of the pleasing visions I had formed, 
and thought no tyrant could invent a death into which I would not run with pleasure from such a life. The king heard of all that had passed between me and my friends upon this occasion, and rallied me very pleasantly, wishing I could send a couple of Stroldbrugs to my own country, to arm our people against the fear of death. But this, it seems, is forbidden by the fundamental laws of the kingdom, or else I should have been well content with the trouble and expense of transporting them. I could not but agree that the laws of this kingdom, relative to the Stroldbrugs, were founded upon the strongest reasons, and such as any other country would be under the necessity of enacting in the like circumstances. Otherwise, as avarice is the necessary consequence of old age, those immortals would in time become proprietors of the whole nation, and engross the civil power, which, for want of abilities to manage, must end in the ruin of the public. End of Part 3 Chapter 10 Part 3 Chapter 11 of Gulliver's Travels This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift Part 3 A Voyage to Laputa, Balnibarbi, Lugnag, Glubdubdrib, and Japan Chapter 11 the author leaves Lugnag and sails to Japan. From thence he returns in a Dutch ship to Amsterdam, and from Amsterdam to England. I thought this account of the Straldbrugs might be some entertainment to the reader, because it seems to be a little out of the common way. At least, I do not remember to have met the like in any book of travels that has come to my hands. And if I am deceived, my excuse must be, that it is necessary for travellers who describe the same country, very often to agree in dwelling on the same particulars, without deserving the censure of having borrowed or transcribed from those who wrote before them. There is indeed a perpetual commerce between this kingdom and the great empire of Japan, and it is very probable that the Japanese authors may have given some account of the Straldbrugs, but my stay in Japan was so short and I was so entirely estranged to the language, that I was not qualified to make any inquiries. But I hope the Dutch, upon this notice, will be curious and able enough to supply my defects. His Majesty, having often pressed me to accept some employment in his court, and finding me absolutely determined to return to my native country, was pleased to grant me his license to depart, and honour me with a letter of recommendation under his own hand, to the Emperor of Japan. He likewise presented me with four hundred and forty-four large pieces of gold, this nation delighting in even numbers, and a red diamond, which I sold in England for eleven hundred pounds. On the 6th of May, 1709, I took a solemn leave of His Majesty and all my friends. This prince was so gracious as to order a guard to conduct me to Glangenstald, which is a royal port to the south-west part of the island. In six days I found a vessel ready to carry me to Japan, and spent fifteen days in the voyage. We landed at a small port town called Zamoshia, situated on the south-east part of Japan. The town lies on the western point, where there is a narrow strait leading northward into a long arm of the sea upon the northwest part of which Yedo, the metropolis, stands. At landing, I showed the custom-house officers my letter from the King of Lugnag to his imperial majesty. They knew the seal perfectly well. It was as broad as the palm of my hand. The impression was a king lifting up a lame beggar from the earth. The magistrates of the town, hearing of my letter, received me as a public minister, they provided me with carriages and servants, and bore my charges to Yedo, where I was admitted to an audience, and delivered my letter, which was opened with great ceremony, and explained to the emperor by an interpreter, who then gave me notice, by his majesty's order, that I should signify my request, and whatever it were, it should be granted for the sake of his royal brother of Lugnag. This interpreter was a person employed to the transact affairs with the Hollanders. 
he soon conjectured by my countenance that I was a European, and therefore repeated his majesty's commands in low Dutch, which he spoke perfectly well. I answered, as I had before determined, that I was a Dutch merchant, shipwrecked in a very remote country, whence I had travelled by sea and land to Lugnag, and then took shipping for Japan, where I knew my countrymen often traded, and with some of these I hoped to get an opportunity of returning into Europe. I therefore most humbly entreated his royal favour, to give order that I should be conducted in safety to Nagasak. To this I added another petition, that, for the sake of my patron the King of Lugnag, his majesty would condescend to excuse my performing the ceremony imposed on my countrymen of trampling upon the crucifix, because I had been thrown into his kingdom by my misfortunes, without any intention of trading. When this latter petition was interpreted to the emperor, he seemed a little surprised, and said, He believed I was the first of my countrymen who ever made any scruple in this point, and that he began to doubt whether I was a real Hollander or not, but rather suspected I must be a Christian. However, for the reasons I had offered, but chiefly to gratify the king of Lugnag by an uncommon mark of his favour, he would comply with the singularity of my humour. But the affair must be managed with dexterity, and his officers should be commanded to let me pass as if it were by forgetfulness. For he assured me, that if the secret should be discovered by my countrymen the Dutch, they would cut my throat in the voyage. I returned my thanks, by the interpreter, for so unusual a favour, and some troops being at that time on their march to Nangasak, the commanding officer had orders to convey me safely thither, with particular instructions about the business of the crucifix. On the ninth day of June, 1709, I arrived at Nangasak, after a very long and troublesome journey. I soon fell into the company of some Dutch sailors, belonging to the Amboyna, of Amsterdam, a stout ship of four hundred and fifty tons. I had lived long in Holland, pursuing my studies at Leyden, and I spoke Dutch well. The seamen soon knew whence I came last. They were curious to inquire into my voyages and course of life. I made up a story as short and probable as I could, but concealed the greatest part. I knew many persons in Holland. I was able to invent names for my parents, whom I pretended to be obscure people in the province of Gelderland. I would have given the captain, one Theodorus van Grolt, what he pleased to ask for my voyage to Holland. But understanding I was a surgeon, he was contented to take half the usual rate, on one condition that I would serve him in the way of my calling. Before we took shipping, I was often asked by some of the crew whether I had performed the ceremony above mentioned. I evaded the question by general answers, that I had satisfied the emperor and court in all particulars. However, a malicious rogue of a skipper went to an officer, and pointing to me told him, I had not yet trampled on the crucifix. But the other, who had received instructions to let me pass, gave the rascal twenty strokes on the shoulders with a bamboo, after which I was no more troubled with such questions. Nothing happened worth mentioning in this voyage. We sailed with a fair wind to the Cape of Good Hope, where we stayed only to take in fresh water. On the 10th of April, 1710, we arrived safe at Amsterdam, having lost only three men by sickness in the voyage, and a fourth, who fell from the foremast into the sea, not far from the coast of Guinea. From Amsterdam I soon after set sail for England, in a small vessel belonging to that city. On the 16th of April we put in at the Downs. I landed next morning, and saw once more my native country, after an absence of five years and six months complete. I went straight to Redriff, where I arrived the same day at two in the afternoon, and found my wife and family in good health. End of Part 3, Chapter 11 Part 4, Chapter 1 of Gulliver's Travels This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Lizzie Driver 
Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift Part 4 A Voyage to the Country of the Houynhnhms Chapter 1 The author sets out as captain of a ship. His men conspire against him, confine him a long time to his cabin, and set him on shore in an unknown land. He travels up into the country. The Yahoos, a strange sort of animal described. The author meets two Houynhnhms. I continued at home with my wife and children about five months, in a very happy condition, if I could have learned the lesson of knowing when I was well. I left my poor wife big with child, and accepted an advantageous offer made me to be captain of the adventurer, a stout merchantman of three hundred and fifty tons. For I understood navigation well, and being grown weary of a surgeon's employment at sea, which, however, I could exercise upon occasion, I took a skilful young man of that calling, one Robert Purefoy, into my ship. We set sail from Portsmouth upon the seventh day of September, 1710. On the fourteenth we met with Captain Pocock of Bristol at Tenerife, who was going to the Bay of Campeche to cut logwood. On the sixteenth he was parted from us by a storm. I heard, since my return, that his ship foundered, and none escaped but one cabin-boy. He was an honest man and a good sailor, but a little too positive in his own opinions, which was the cause of his destruction, as it has been with several others, for, if he had followed my advice, he might have been safe at home with his family at this time, as well as myself. I had several men who died in my ship of Calinchers, so that I was forced to get recruits out of Barbados and the Leeward Islands where I touched, by the direction of the merchants who employed me, which I had soon too much cause to repent, for I found afterwards that most of them had been buccaneers. I had fifty hands on board, and my orders were that I should trade with the Indians in the South Sea, and make what discoveries I could. These rogues, whom I had picked up, debauched my other men, and they all formed a conspiracy to seize the ship, and secure me, which they did one morning, rushing into my cabin and binding me hand and foot, threatening to throw me overboard if I offered to stir. I told them I was their prisoner and would submit. This they made me swear to do, and then they unbound me, only fastening one of my legs with a chain near my bed, and placed a sentry at my door with his piece charged, who was commanded to shoot me dead if I attempted my liberty. They sent me own victuals and drink, and took the government of the ship to themselves. Their design was to turn pirates, and plunder the Spaniards, which they could not do till they got more men. But first they resolved to sell the goods in the ship, and then go to Madagascar for recruits, several among them having died since my confinement. They sailed many weeks, and traded with the Indians, but I knew not what course they took, being kept a prisoner in my cabin, and expecting nothing less than to be murdered, as they often threatened me. Upon the ninth day of May, 1711, one James Welch came down to my cabin, and said, he had orders from the captain to set me ashore. I expostulated with him, but in vain. Neither would he so much as tell me who their new captain was. They forced me into the longboat, letting me put on my best suit of clothes, which were as good as new, and take a small bundle of linen, but no arms except my hanger. And they were so civil as not to search my pockets, into which I conveyed what money I had, with some other little necessaries. They rowed about a league, and then set me down on a strand. I desired them to tell me what country it was. They all swore, they knew no more than myself, but said that the captain, as they called him, was resolved, after they had sold the ladding, to get rid of me in the first place where they could discover land. They pushed off immediately, advising me to make haste for fear of being overtaken by the tide, and so bade me farewell. In this desolate condition I advanced forward, and soon got upon firm ground where I sat down on a bank to rest myself, and consider what I had best do. 
when i was a little refreshed i went up into the country resolving to deliver myself to the first savages i should meet and purchase my life from them by some bracelets glass rings and other toys which sailors usually provide themselves with in those voyages and whereof i had some about me the land was divided by long rows of trees not regularly planted but naturally growing there was great plenty of grass and several fields of oats i walked very circumspectly for fear of being surprised or suddenly shot with an arrow from behind or on either side i fell into a beaten road where i saw many tracks of human feet and some of cows but most of horses at last i beheld several animals in a field and one or two of the same kind sitting in trees their shape was very singular and deformed which a little discomposed me so that i lay down behind a thicket to observe them better some of them coming forward near the place where i lay gave me an opportunity of distinctly making their form their heads and breasts were covered with a thick hair some frizzled and others lank they had beards like goats and a long ridge of hair down their backs and the fore parts of their legs and feet but the rest of their bodies was bare so that i might see their skins which were of a brown buff colour they had no tails nor any hair at all on their buttocks except about the anus which i presume nature had planted there to defend them as they sat on the ground for this posture they used as well as lying down and often stood on their hind feet they climbed high trees as nimbly as a squirrel for they had strong extended claws before and behind terminating in sharp points and hooked they would often spring and bound and leap with prodigious agility the females were not so large as the males they had long lank hair on their heads but none on their faces nor anything more than a sort of down on the rest of their bodies except about the anus and pudenda the dugs hung between their forefeet and often reached almost to the ground as they walked the hair of both sexes was of several colours brown red black and yellow upon the whole i never beheld in all my travels so disagreeable an animal or one against which i naturally conceived so strong an antipathy so that thinking i had seen enough full of contempt and aversion i got up and pursued the beaten road hoping it might direct me to the cabin of some indian i had not got far when i met one of these creatures full in my way and coming up directly to me the ugly monster when he saw me distorted several ways every feature of his visage and stared as at an object he had never seen before then approaching nearer lifted up his forepaw whether out of curiosity or mischief i could not tell but i drew my hanger and gave him a good blow with the flat side of it for i durst not strike with the edge fearing the inhabitants might be provoked against me if they should come to know that i had killed or maimed any of their cattle when the beast felt the smart he drew back and roared so loud that a herd of at least forty came flocking about me from the next field howling and making odious faces but i ran to the body of a tree and leaning my back against it kept them off by waving my hanger several of this cursed brood getting hold of the branches behind leaped up into the tree whence they began to discharge their excrements on my head however i escaped pretty well by sticking close to the stem of the tree but was almost stifled with the filth which fell about me on every side in the midst of this distress i observed them all to run away on a sudden as fast as they could at which i ventured to leave the tree and pursue the road wondering what it was that could put them into this fright but looking on my left hand i saw a horse walking softly in the field which my persecutors having sooner discovered was the cause of their flight the horse started a little when he came near me but soon recovering himself looked full in my face with manifest tokens of wonder he viewed my hands and feet 
walking round me several times. I would have pursued my journey, but he placed himself directly in the way, yet looking with a very mild aspect, never offering the least violence. We stood gazing at each other for some time. At last I took the boldness to reach my hand towards his neck, with a design to stroke it, using the common style and whistle of jockeys, when they are going to handle a strange horse. But this strange animal seemed to receive my civilities with disdain, shook his head and bent his brows, softly raising up his right forefoot to remove my hand. Then he neighed three or four times, but in so different a cadence that I began to think he was speaking to himself in some language of his own. While he and I were thus employed, another horse came up, who, applying himself to the first in a very formal manner, they gently struck each other's right hoof, before neighing several times by turns, and varying the sound, which seemed to be almost articulate. They went some paces off, as if it were to confer together, walking side by side, backward and forward, like persons deliberating upon some affair of weight, but often turning their eyes towards me, as if it were to watch that I might not escape. I was amazed to see such actions and behaviour in brute beasts, and concluded with myself, that if the inhabitants of this country were endued with a proportional degree of reason, they must needs be the wisest people upon earth. This thought gave me so much comfort, that I resolved to go forward, until I could discover some house or village, or meet with any of the natives, leaving the two horses to discourse together as they pleased. But the first, who was a dapple grey, observing me to steal off, neighed after me in so expressive a tone, that I fancied myself to understand what he meant. Whereupon I turned back, and came near to him to expect his father commands. But concealing my fear as much as I could, for I began to be in some pain how this adventure might terminate. And the reader will easily believe I did not much like my present situation. The two horses came up close to me, looking with great earnestness upon my face and hands. The grey steed rubbed my hat all around with his right forehoof, and discomposed it so much that I was forced to adjust it better by taking it off and settling it again. Whereat, both he and his companion, who was a brown bay, appeared to be much surprised. The latter felt the lappet of my coat, and finding it to hang loose about me, they both looked with new signs of wonder. He stroked my right hand, seeming to admire the softness and colour, but he squeezed it so hard between his hoof and his pastern that I was forced to roar, after which they both touched me with all possible tenderness. They were under great perplexity about my shoes and stockings, which they felt very often, neighing to each other and using various gestures, not unlike those of a philosopher, when he would attempt to solve some new and difficult phenomenon. Upon the whole, the behaviour of these animals was so orderly and rational, so acute and judicious, that I at last concluded they must needs be magicians, who had thus metamorphosed themselves upon some design, and seeing a stranger in the way, resolved to divert themselves with him, or perhaps were really amazed at the sight of a man so very different in habit, feature and complexion, from those who might probably live in so remote a climate. Upon the strength of this reasoning, I ventured to address them in the following manner. Gentlemen, if you be conjurers, as I have good cause to believe, you can understand my language. Therefore I make bold to let your worships know that I am a poor, distressed Englishman, driven by his misfortunes upon your coast, and I entreat one of you to let me ride upon his back, as if he were a real horse, to some house or village where I can be relieved. In return of which favour, I will make you a present of this knife and bracelet, taking them out of my pocket. The two creatures stood silent while I spoke, seeming to listen with great attention, and when I had ended, they neighed frequently towards each other, 
as if they were engaged in serious conversation. I plainly observed that their language expressed the passions very well, and the words might, with little pains, be resolved into an alphabet more easily than the Chinese. I could frequently distinguish the word Yahoo, which was repeated by each of them several times, and although it was impossible for me to conjecture what it meant, yet while the two horses were busy in conversation, I endeavoured to practise this word upon my tongue, and as soon as they were silent, I boldly pronounced Yahoo in a loud voice, imitating at the same time, as near as I could, the neighing of a horse, at which they were both visibly surprised, and the grey repeated the same word twice, as if he meant to teach me the right accent, wherein I spoke after him as well as I could, and found myself perceivably to improve every time, though very far from any degree of perfection. Then the bay tried me with a second word, much harder to be pronounced, but reducing it to the English orthography may be spelt thus, Huinum. I did not succeed in this so well as in the former, but after two or three farther trials I had better fortune, and they both appeared amazed at my capacity. After some further discourse, which I then conjectured might relate to me, the two friends took their leave, with the same compliment of striking each other's hoof, and the grey made me signs that I should walk before him, wherein I thought it prudent to comply, till I could find a better director. When I offered to slacken my pace, he would cry, Hum! Hum! I guessed his meaning, and gave him to understand, as well as I could, that I was weary and not able to walk faster, upon which he would stand a while to let me rest. End of Part 4 Chapter 1 Part 4 Chapter 2 of Gulliver's Travels this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part 4. A Voyage to the Country of the Huynhams. Chapter 2. The author conducted by a Huynham to his house. The house described. The author's reception. The food of the Huynhams, the author in distress for want of meat, is at last relieved, his manner of feeding in this country. Having travelled about three miles, we came to a long kind of building, made of timber stuck in the ground and wattled across. The roof was low and covered with straw. I now began to be a little comforted, and took out some toys which travellers usually carry for presents to the savage Indians of America and other parts, in hopes the people of the house would be thereby encouraged to receive me kindly. The horse made me a sign to go in first. It was a large room with a smooth clay floor, and a rack and manger, extending the whole length on one side. There were three nags and two mares, not eating, but some of them sitting down upon their hands, which I very much wondered at, but wondered more to see the rest employed in domestic business. These seemed but ordinary cattle. However, this confirmed my first opinion, that a people who could so far civilize brute animals must needs excel in wisdom all the nations of the world. The grey came in just after, and thereby prevented any ill-treatment which the others might have given me. He neighed to them several times in a style of authority, and received answers. Beyond this room there were three others, reaching the length of the house, to which he passed through three open doors, opposite to each other, in the manner of a vista. We went through the second room towards the third. Here the grey walked in first, beckoning me to attend, I waited in the second room, and got ready my presents for the master and mistress of the house. There were two knives, three bracelets of false pearls, a small looking-glass, and a bead necklace. The horse neighed three or four times, and I waited to hear some answers in a human voice, 
but I heard no other returns than in the same dialect, only one or two a little shriller than his. I began to think that this house must belong to some person of great note among them, because there appeared so much ceremony before I could gain admittance. But that a man of quality should be served all by horses was beyond my comprehension. I feared my brain was disturbed by my sufferings and misfortunes. I roused myself and looked about me in the room where I was left alone. This was furnished like the first, only after a more elegant manner. I rubbed my eyes often, but the same object still occurred. I pinched my arms and sides to awake myself, hoping I might be in a dream. I then absolutely concluded that all these appearances could be nothing else but necromancy and magic. But I had no time to pursue these reflections, for the grey horse came to the door, and made me a sign to follow him into the third room, where I saw a very comely mare, together with a colt and foal, sitting on their haunches upon mats of straw, not unartfully made, and perfectly neat and clean. The mare, soon after my entrance, rose from her mat, and coming up close, after having nicely observed my hands and face, gave me a most contemptuous look, and turning to the horse, I heard the word Yahoo often repeated betwixt them, the meaning of which word I could not then comprehend, although it was the first I had learned to pronounce. But I was soon better informed, to my everlasting mortification, for the horse, beckoning to me with his head, and repeated the Huin Huin, as he did upon the road, which I understood was to attend him, led me out into a kind of court, where was another building at some distance from the house. Here we entered, and I saw three of those detestable creatures, which I first met after my landing, feeding upon roots and the flesh of some animals, which I afterwards found to be that of asses and dogs, and now and then a cow, dead by accident or disease. They were all tied by the neck with strong withs, fastened to a beam. They held their food between the claws of their forefeet, and tore it with their teeth. The master horse ordered a sorrel nag, one of his servants, to untie the largest of these animals, and take him into the yard. The beast and I were brought close together, and by our countenances diligently compared both by master and servant, who thereupon repeated several times the word Yahoo. My horror and astonishment are not to be described, when I observed in these abominable animals a perfect human figure. The face of it indeed was flat and broad, the nose depressed, the lips large and the mouth wide. But these differences are common to all savage nations, where the lineaments of the countenance are distorted by the natives suffering their infants to lie grovelling on the earth, or by carrying them on their back, nuzzling with their face against the mother's shoulders. The forefeet of the Yahoo differed from my hands in nothing else but the length of the nails, the coarseness and brownness of the palms, and the hairiness on the backs. There was the same resemblance between our feet, with the same differences, which I knew very well, though the horses did not, because of my shoes and stockings. The same in every part of our bodies, except as to hairiness and colour, which I have already described. The great difficulty that seemed to stick with the two horses, was to see the rest of my body so very different from that of a yahoo, for which I was obliged to my clothes, whereof they had no conception. The sorrel nag offered me a root, which he held, after their manner as we shall describe in its proper place, between his hoof and pastern. I took it in my hand, and having smelt it, returned it to him again as civilly as I could. He bought out of the Yahoo's kennel a piece of ass's flesh, but it smelt so offensively that I turned from it with loathing. He then threw it to the Yahoo, by whom it was greedily devoured. He afterwards showed me a wisp of hay and a fetlock full of oats, but I shook my head, 
to signify that neither of these were food for me. And indeed I now apprehended that I must absolutely starve, if I did not get to some of my own species. For as to those filthy yahoos, although there were few great lovers of mankind at that time than myself, yet I confess I never saw any sensitive being so detestable on all accounts, and the more I came near them the more hateful they grew while I stayed in that country. This the master horse observed by my behaviour, and therefore sent the yahoo back to his kennel. He then put his fore hoof to his mouth, at which I was much surprised, although he did it with ease, and with a motion that appeared perfectly natural, and made other signs to know what I would eat. But I could not return him such an answer as he was able to apprehend, and if he had understood me, I did not see how it was possible to contrive any way for finding myself nourishment. While we were thus engaged, I observed a cow passing by, whereupon I pointed to her, and expressed a desire to go and milk her. This had its effect, for he led me back into the house, and ordered a mare-servant to open a room, where a good store of milk lay in earthen and wooden vessels. After a very orderly and cleanly manner, she gave me a large bowlful, of which I drank very heartily, and found myself well refreshed. About noon I saw, coming towards the house, a kind of vehicle drawn like a sledge by four yahoos. There was in it an old steed, who seemed to be of quality. He alighted with his hind feet forward, having by accident got hurt in his left fore foot. He came to dine with our horse, who received him with great civility. They dined in the best room, and had oats boiled in milk for the second course, which the old horse ate warm, but the rest cold. Their mangers were placed circular in the middle of the room, and divided into several partitions, round which they sat on their haunches, upon bosses of straw. In the middle was a large rack, with angles answering to every partition of the manger, so that each horse and mare ate their own hay, and their own mash of oats and milk, with much decency and regularity. The behaviour of the young colt and foal appeared very modest, and that of the master and mistress extremely cheerful and complacent to their guest. The grey ordered me to stand by him, and much discourse passed between him and his friend concerning me, as I found by the strangers often looking on me, and the frequent repetition of the word Yahoo. I happened to wear my gloves, which the Master Grey observing seemed perplexed, discovering signs of wonder what I had done to my forefeet. He put his hoof three or four times to them, as if he would signify that I should reduce them to their former shape, which I presently did, pulling off both my gloves and putting them into my pocket. This occasioned farther talk, and I saw the company was pleased with my behaviour, whereof I soon found the good effects. I was ordered to speak the few words I understood, and while they were at dinner, the master taught me the names for oats, milk, fire, water, and some others, which I could readily pronounce after him, having from my youth a great facility in learning languages. When dinner was done, the master horse took me aside and by signs and words made me understand the concern he was in in that I had nothing to eat. Oats in their tongue are called hulna. The word I pronounced two or three times, for although I had refused them at first, yet upon second thoughts I considered that I could contrive to make of them a kind of bread, which might be sufficient with milk to keep me alive, till I could make my escape to some other country and to creatures of my own species. The horse immediately ordered a white mare-servant of his family to bring me a good quantity of oats and a sort of wooden tray. These I heated before the fire, as well as I could, and rubbed them till the husks came off, which I made a sift to winnow from the grain. I ground and beat them between two stones, then took water, and made them into a paste or cake, which I toasted at the fire and ate warm with milk. 
It was at first a very insipid diet, though common enough in many parts of Europe, but grew tolerable by time, and having often been reduced to hard fare in my life, this was not the first experiment I had made how easily nature is satisfied. And I cannot but observe that I never had one hour's sickness while I stayed in this island. It is true I sometimes made a shift to catch a rabbit or bird by springs made of yahoo's hairs, and I often gathered wholesome herbs which I boiled and ate as salads with my bread. And now and then, for a rarity, I made a little butter and drank the whey. I was at first at a great loss for salt, but custom soon reconciled me to the want of it, and I am confident that the frequent use of salt among us is an effect of luxury, and was first introduced only as a provocative to drink, except where it is necessary for preserving flesh in long voyages, or in places remote from great markets for we observe no animal to be fond of it but man, and as to myself, when I left this country, it was a great while before I could endure the taste of it in anything that I ate. This is enough to say upon the subject of my diet, wherewith other travellers fill their books, as if the reader were personally concerned whether we fare well or ill. However, it was necessary to mention this matter, lest the world should think it impossible that I could find sustenance for three years in such a country, and among such inhabitants. When it grew towards evening, the master horse ordered a place for me to lodge in. It was but six yards from the house, and separated from the stable of the yahoos. Here I got some straw, and covering myself with my own clothes, slept very sound but I was in a short time better accommodated, as the reader shall know hereafter, when I come to treat more particularly about my way of living. End of Part 4 Chapter 2 Part 4 Chapter 3 of Gulliver's Travels This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Lizzie Driver Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift Part 4 A Voyage to the Country of the Houyhnhnms Chapter 3 The author studies to learn the language. The Houyhnhnm, his master, assists in teaching him, the language described. Several Houyhnhnms of quality come out of curiosity to see the author. He gives his master a short account of his voyage. My principal endeavour was to learn the language, which my master, for so I shall henceforth call him, and his children, and every servant of his house, were desirous to teach me. For they looked upon it as a prodigy, that a brute animal should discover such marks of a rational creature. I pointed to everything, and acquired the name of it, which I wrote down in my journal book when I was alone, and corrected my bad accent by desiring those of the family to pronounce it often. In this employment a sorrel nag, one of the under-servants, was very ready to assist me. In speaking they pronounced through the nose and throat, and their language approaches nearest to the high Dutch or German of any I know in Europe, but is much more graceful and significant. The Emperor Charles V made almost the same observation when he said, that if he were to speak to his horse, it should be in high Dutch. The curiosity and impatience of my master was so great that he spent many hours of his leisure to instruct me. He was convinced, as he afterwards told me, that I must be a Yahoo. But my teachableness, civility, and cleanliness astonished him, which were qualities altogether opposite to those animals. He was most perplexed about my clothes, reasoning sometimes with himself whether they were a part of my body, for I never pulled them off till the family were asleep, and got them on before they waked in the morning. My master was eager to learn whence I came, how I acquired those appearances of reason, which I discovered in all my actions, and to know my story from my own mouth, which he hoped he should soon do by the great proficiency I made in learning 
and pronouncing their words and sentences. To help my memory, I formed all I learned into the English alphabet, and writ the words down with the translations. This last, after some time, I ventured to do in my master's presence. It cost me much trouble to explain to him what I was doing, for the inhabitants have not the least idea of books or literature. In about ten weeks' time I was able to understand most of his questions, and in three months could give him some tolerable answers. He was extremely curious to know, from what part of the country I came, and how I was taught to imitate a rational creature, because the yahoos, whom he saw I exactly resembled in my head, hands, and face, that were only visible, with some appearance of cunning, and the strongest disposition to mischief, were observed to be the most unteachable of all brutes. I answered, that I came over the sea, from a far place with many others of my own kind, in a great hollow vessel made of the bodies of trees, that my companions forced me to land on this coast, and then left me to shift for myself. It was with some difficulty, and by the help of many signs, that I brought him to understand me. He replied, that I must needs be mistaken, or that I said the thing which was not, for they have no word in their language to express lying or falsehood. He knew it was impossible that there could be a country beyond the sea, or that a parcel of brutes could move a wooden vessel whither they pleased upon water. He was sure no Hwinnom alive could make such a vessel, nor would trust Yahoos to manage it. The word Hwinnom, in their tongue, signifies a horse, and, in its etymology, the perfection of nature. I told my master that I was at a loss for expression, but would improve as fast as I could, and hoped, in a short time, I would be able to tell him wonders. He was pleased to direct his own mare, his colt and foal, and the servants of the family, to take all opportunities of instructing me, and every day, for two or three hours, he was at the same pains himself. Several horses and mares of quality in the neighbourhood came often to our house, upon the report spread of a wonderful yahoo that could speak like a whinnom, and seemed in his words and actions, to discover some glimmerings of reason. These delighted to converse with me. They put many questions, and received such answers as I was able to return. By all these advantages I made so great a progress, that in five months from my arrival I understood whatever was spoken, and could express myself tolerably well. The Whinhams, who came to visit my master out of a design of seeing and talking with me, could hardly believe me to be a right yahoo, because my body had a different covering from others of my kind. They were astonished to observe me without the usual hair or skin, except on my head, face, and hands. But I discovered that secret to my master, upon an accident which happened about a fortnight before. I have already told the reader that every night, when the family were gone to bed, it was my custom to strip and cover myself with my clothes. It happened one morning early that my master sent for me by the sorrel nag, who was his valet. When he came I was fast asleep, my clothes fallen off on one side, and my shirt above my waist. I awaked at the noise he made, and observed him to deliver his message in some disorder, after which he went to my master, and in a great fright gave him a very confused account of what he had seen. This I presently discovered, for, going as soon as I was dressed to pay my attendance upon his honour, he asked me the meaning of what his servant had reported, that I was not the same thing when I slept, as I appeared to be at other times, that his valet assured him some part of me was white, some yellow, at least not so white, and some brown. I had hitherto concealed the secret of my dress, in order to distinguish myself as much as possible from that cursed race of yahoos, but now I found it in vain to do so any longer. 
Besides, I considered that my clothes and shoes would soon wear out, which already were in a declining condition, and must be supplied by some contrivance, from the hides of yahoos, or other brutes, whereby the whole secret would be known. I therefore told my master, that in the country whence I came, those of my kind always covered their bodies with the hairs of certain animals prepared by art, as well as for decency, as to avoid the inclemencies of air, both hot and cold, of which, as to my own person, I would give him immediate conviction, if he pleased to command me, only desiring his excuse, if I did not expose those parts that nature taught us to conceal. He said, my discourse was all very strange, but especially the last part, for he could not understand why nature should teach us to conceal what nature had given. That neither himself nor family were ashamed of any parts of their bodies. But, however, I might do as I pleased. Whereupon I first unbuttoned my coat and pulled it off. I did the same with my waistcoat. I drew off my shoes, stockings and breeches. I let my shirt down to my waist and drew up the bottom fastening it like a girdle about my middle, to hide my nakedness. My master observed the whole performance with great signs of curiosity and admiration. He took up all my clothes in his pastern, one piece after another, and examined them diligently. He then stroked my body very gently, and looked round me several times. After which, he said, it was plain I must be a perfect yahoo, but that I differed very much from the rest of my species in the softness, whiteness, and smoothness of my skin. My want of hair in several parts of my body, the shape and shortness of my claws behind and before, and my affectation of walking continually on my two hinder feet. He desired to see no more, and gave me leave to put on my clothes again, for I was shuddering with cold. I expressed my uneasiness at his giving me so often the appellation of Yahoo, an odious animal, for which I had so utter a hatred and contempt. I begged he would forbear applying that word to me, and make the same order in his family and among his friends whom he suffered to see me. I requested likewise, that the secret of my having a false covering to my body might be known to none but himself at least as long as my present clothing should last. For as to what the sorrel nag his valet had observed, his honour might command him to conceal it. All this my master very graciously consented to, and thus the secret was kept till my clothes began to wear out, which I was forced to supply by several contrivances that shall hereafter be mentioned. In the meantime he desired, I would go on with my utmost diligence to learn their language, because he was more astonished at my captivity for speech and reason, than at the figure of my body, whether it were covered or not, adding, that he waited with some impatience to hear the wonders which I promised to tell him. Thenceforward he doubled the pains he had been at to instruct me. He brought me into all company, and made them treat me with civility, because, as he told them privately, this would put me into good humour, and make me more diverting. Every day when I waited on him, beside the trouble he was at in teaching, he would ask me several questions concerning myself, which I answered as well as I could, and by these means he had already received some general ideas, though very imperfect. It would be tedious to relate the several steps by which I advanced to a more regular conversation, but the first account I gave of myself in any order and length was to this purpose, that I came from a very far country, as I already had attempted to tell him, with about fifty more of my own species, that we travelled upon the seas in a great hollow vessel made of wood, and larger than his honour's house. I described the ship to him in the best terms I could, and explained, by the health of my handkerchief displayed, how it was driven forward by the wind. That, upon a quarrel among us, I was set on shore on this coast, where I walked forward, without knowing whither, 
till he had delivered me from the persecution of those execrable yahoos. He asked me who made the ship, and how it was possible that the Huynhams of my country would leave it to the management of brutes. My answer was that I durst proceed no further in my relation, unless he would give me his word and honour that he would not be offended, and then I would tell him the wonders I had so often promised. He agreed, and I went on by assuring him that the ship was made by creatures like myself, who, in all the countries I had travelled, as well as in my own, were the only governing rational animals, and that, upon my arrival hither, I was as much astonished to see the Whinhams act like rational beings, as he or his friends could be, in finding some marks of reason in a creature he was pleased to call a Yahoo, to which I owned my resemblance in every part, but could not account for their degenerate and brutal nature. I said farther, that if good fortune ever restored me to my native country, to relate my travels hither as I resolved to do, everybody would believe that I said the thing that was not, that I invented the story out of my own head, and, with all possible respect to himself, his family, and his friends, and under his promise of not being offended, our countrymen would hardly think it probable that a Wynnum should be the presiding creature of a nation, and a Yahoo the brute. End of Part 4, Chapter 3「Part 4, Chapter 4 of Gulliver's Travels. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver. Gulliver's Travels by Jonathan Swift. Part 4. A Voyage to the Country of the Whinhams. Chapter 4. The Whinhams' Notion of Truth and Falsehood. The author's discourse disapproved by his master. The author gives a more particular account of himself, and the accidents of his voyage. My master heard me with great appearances of uneasiness in his countenance, because doubting, or not believing, are so little known in this country, that the inhabitants cannot tell how to behave themselves under such circumstances. And I remember, in frequent discourses with my master concerning the nature of manhood in other parts of the world, having occasion to talk of lying and false reputation, it was with much difficulty that he comprehended what I meant, although he had otherwise a most acute judgment. For he argued thus, that the use of speech was to make us understand one another, and to receive information of facts. Now, if any one said the thing which was not, these ends were defeated, because I cannot properly be said to understand him, and I am so far from receiving information that he leaves me worse than in ignorance, for I am led to believe a thing black when it is white, and short when it is long. And these were all the notions he had concerning the faculty of lying, so perfectly well understood, and so universally practised among human creatures. To return from this digression, when I asserted that the Yahoos were the only governing animals in my country, which my master said was altogether past his conception, he desired to know whether we had Whinhams among us, and what was their employment. I told him we had great numbers, that in summer they grazed in the fields, and in winter were kept in houses with hay and oats, where Yahoo servants were employed to rub their skins smooth, comb their manes, pick their feet, serve them with food, and make their beds. "'I understand you well,' said my master. "'It is now very plain, from all you have spoken, "'that whatever share of reason the Yahoos pretend to, "'the Whinhams are your masters. "'I heartily wish our Yahoos would be so tractable.' "'I begged. "'His honour would please to excuse me from proceeding any further.' because I was very certain that the account he expected from me would be highly displeasing. But he insisted in commanding me to let him know the best and the worst. I told him he should be obeyed. I owned that the Huynhams among us, whom we call horses, were the most generous and comely animals we had, 
that they excelled in strength and swiftness, and when they belonged to persons of quality, were employed in travelling, racing, or drawing chariots. They were treated with much kindness and care, till they fell into disease, or became foundered in the feet, but then they were sold, and used to all kind of drudgery till they died. After which their skins were stripped, and sold for what they were worth, and their bodies left to be devoured by dogs and birds of prey. But the common race of horses had not so good fortune, being kept by farmers and carriers, and other mean people, who put them to great labour and fed them worse. I described, as well as I could, 